diehards. And put it on mine too if you want. Okay. Yeah, definitely. All right, we're live. We usually give it a few minutes to warm up, let people, let people get on. I still got nothing. All right, guys, we are live for the newest episode with everyone's old favorite writer from the new set. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there's a the thing I have to say that for a little I might wow. need some CPR over here quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, feel free to ask as many questions as you like. I know a lot of you are on a bus ride to Cincinnati at the moment or getting ready to be. I don't even remember what time that thing's leaving. So the Comic the Cruisers? Yep, the yeah. Cruisers uh, filled that bus up really fast. Yeah. So, they wanted to go see Cody. <laughs> oh, that's going to be a fun one when he comes here. Uh, so, yeah, ask as many questions you want. Um, within reason, we'll get to everything we can. Yeah, we'll stay till we get them. How's that? Yeah, there we go. So, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Blake, good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, everyone has been asking what you've been up to, so we'll let you go ahead and talk about life nowadays. Oh, I'm still writing every day. It's just not on the comments. Um, right now, I work for uh, Park Center at Shepherd's House. And um, I uh, am the chaplain, the driver, the resume writer, the uh, desk shift. Uh, I help with donations, um, a lot of mentoring. Just it's a, uh, I, I work primarily for Choices Treatment Center, which is a, a, a transitional living facility that helps uh, addicts and alcoholics uh, try to get their feet back under them. And uh, a lot of Shepherd's House, which is veterans, homeless veterans who are trying to uh, get their feet back on them with dealing with addictions too. Awesome. We have several people joining. Uh, everybody says hello. Hi uh, guys. Hello fellas. <laughs> uh, good to see a few other things here. So, um, so it's been what, two years since you've been? A uh, year and a half. Well, uh, August, well, uh, August 7th, August 7th? Of, uh, 19th or 2017. Man, I can't believe it's been that long already. So, We'll let everybody, we'll, we'll get this all explained because I've already got a message over here. Uh, why is it, if you don't mind, yeah, that fine. you don't follow the comment or write or talk about the comments much? Like you kind of disappear from the pages. Um, because it was painful. I mean, I gave uh, 28 years of my life to that. And, um, you know, everybody's used to accuse me of being a fan, but I really wasn't. It was my job. It was mm -hmm. my career. I was passionate about it. And everybody thought I was a fan because I was so passionate about it, but they only read me on the comments. They didn't read me on volleyball or gymnastics or girl sports tennis. or tennis. You know, I mean, I was just as passionate about all those as I was the comments. Right. And, and frankly, it's, it's painful to go back a little bit. I mean, cause I, I went to three games last year and I was extremely uncomfortable. Yeah. It just was not fun for me, you know, cause I, I missed it. And, uh, it was it was kind of uncomfortable. It's understandable. Um, and just so you guys know, we already talked. And for everybody that bashes on Coney like crazy, uh, stop. I'll talk about that if you want. Yeah, go ahead. I have tremendous respect for Justin, and that's part of the reason I don't go back. Is I don't want to hear that crap. I don't want to hear. 
people say, I wish they'd fire Justin and hire you. That is the absolute last thing that I want to happen. And even if offered, I don't know that I would go back right now because I'm not replacing him in any way, shape, or form. He doesn't need replaced. I think he does an excellent job. Yep. You guys don't understand how hard it is. The game ends at 1045, and he's got an 11 o'clock deadline. And he's got to run downstairs to get the quotes and things from the coach and be in the press conference after he files his first story. Then he's got two more stories to write. That is not easy to do. He does an excellent job at that. He really does. I mean, nobody could do as well in that kind of time constraints as he does. Definitely. I have a tremendous amount of respect for Justin. I mean, I think he's an even a better father than he is a writer. Uh, and he's just he's just a great writer and father and husband, I think, and, and he needs to be respected for that. Definitely. So we'll go on to a happier terms on <laughs> so, okay. You can ask more questions about that. <laughs> I really don't care. I mean, yeah, but this is awesome. Yeah. So I'm so shy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stop holding back. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what we told AJ. Just be yourself, don't hold back. Yeah. <laughs> um all right, so let's talk about your books a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's uh, let's share some books because a lot of guys have asked if we know what books what the books are about and everything. Let's okay. Okay. Um, well, like I said, I still write every day. I just don't write about the comments. I'm writing right now. I'm writing two stories a week for the journal. I'm writing in features, and I'm writing in sports. Um, and I'm, I've got three stories to write this weekend. You know, I mean, I'm still writing quite a bit because I love that so much. It's it's really part of who I am. Sure. Um, and uh, I've got 12 books out there. They're all available on Amazon at Blake Sebring on my Amazon site. Um, I've got ideas for at least four more, maybe five. But the problem is I don't have time to write them as much anymore. <laughs> so because I'm trying to keep up financially and stuff and, um, you know, working for a nonprofit, it doesn't pay as much. And I'm not complaining in the least because I absolutely love what I do. Sure. It's incredibly fulfilling. I mean, it is just amazing. Every day, you get to see the Holy Spirit actually walking in the door, you know, yeah. and, and really do some positive things for some people who are struggling and down on their luck and trying to get back. I mean, and aren't we all really? I mean, in a bigger yeah. picture, yeah. you know, and it's just it's incredibly fulfilling. It's just, I mean, every day I, I get to give hugs and slaps on the back and a kick in the ass and. Um, you know, I get to help guys and, it, and you just get to help. I mean, it's so much, I don't want to say fun, but it's just so fulfilling. It's just amazing. Um, and then I, I write the books. That's kind of like my, become my hobby. Um, I'll start from the start. Um, we got the first one was Tales of the Comets where I tried to, this is where I taught myself how to write a book. And um, I tried to find all the funny stories over the years that I'd done on the comets. And, and put them all together in different things. Um, and that was the first book. And then I had so much fun with that, I did uh, move to Legends of the Comets, which was at the time about all the guys who had their numbers retired. So we show covers. Yeah, I stuff. keep forgetting we're on, you know, <laughs> we're on video. Yeah, I'm, I got a, like I was always told, I have a, a face for newspapers, <laughs> and, and a, a, a face for radio, and a, noise, and a voice for newspapers. <laughs> That's so, great. Uh, so I had so much fun with Tales of the Comets that I went and did uh, uh, Legends of the Comets, which was about all the guys who had their numbers retired to that point. It was like 10-page yeah. biographies. And that was an absolute blast because I really got to sit down and, and really get to know all those guys and their families and stuff. That's awesome. And that was amazing. It was amazing how many of those guys had tragedies early in their lives. Eddie Long lost two brothers in World War II. Um, just it's just incredible. Robbie Irons lost a brother. Um, it was just incredible how many guys had failed yeah. and still came back and they made new lives here. And you know they all thought they were going somewhere else quick. They thought they were going home and they thought they were moving up. And almost all of them stayed. I mean, uh, the primos were at the crossroads. They had gotten cut from somewhere and they were on the crossroads where they either go to Fort Wayne or they go home to. Prince Albert, and, they, and Reggie called his mom, and she says, don't you come home. <laughs> <laughs> and he was married, and they had three kids, and one of them was in diapers, the old cloth diapers. Oh, wow. In the back seat. Mm -hmm. You know, he was like, and they came here, and they've never left. I mean, there are so many cool stories like that in there and how they have impacted Fort Wayne, and Fort Wayne has impacted them, too. I mean, the city, you, you think about it, the Pistons were here. 
the NBA was here. Yeah. And the Comets stole everybody's hearts. Mm -hmm. And they did it because of guys like George Drysdale and Eddie and Reggie and Lenny and Chuck Adamson and, and, and Lionel and all those guys. And they all stayed. Mm -hmm. I mean, they built families here. They built their, their lives here. And they're still here, most of them, or they're buried here. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. um, Chaser's they, another one. Chaser's another one. I mean, you think about it. Without uh, Chaser and Eddie Long and Ken Elliott and Bud Gallmire, the Comets would have died five years in, without a doubt. Yeah. Bud kept them on the front page every day. Bob was talking them on the radio, and he had such a huge influence. Uh, Eddie really defined what it meant to be to be a comet on the ice. George did it off the ice. Yeah. And he did, he was great on the ice too. I'm not denigrating him at all, but George set the standard for what it meant to be a gentleman and uh, uh, what the comets mean off the ice. And then you, you throw in Colin Lister, you know, I mean, without any of those five guys, the comets probably die five years in. I mean, yep. without much even thought, I mean, but five years in was when Ken and Colin came. Yeah. You know, they, the other guys got him to that point, and then Lenny came in like the year before. You know, I mean, I still say that's the best best player to never make the NHL, in my opinion. Oh yeah, yeah. He um, got screwed before the expansion era. Yeah, yeah, he really did. I mean, if he had been with any other team except Montreal, yeah, he probably so would Chuck. You know, mm -hmm. they both probably should have been there. You know, yeah, but they were stuck underneath the Canadians. You know, you talk about George. I remember I was talking to Scott Sprout one day. Uh, we were setting up the alumni party we were having over the George summer. still sets the standard. Yeah, and Scott said, he goes, if George Drysdale is anywhere, I'm going to be there. Oh, exactly. I love that man. George is, has become, he, he's the guy, he never says a lot. But when he does, you listen, because it's like, oh, crap, Grandpa just lost it. He you better pay up, shut up, and pay attention, you yep. know? And George is always very, very, you know what he says is important. Yeah. You know, and Eddie's the same way, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not, you know, you, you, those two are equals, you know. Um, I still go visit Eddie all the time. I mean, love those guys. Uh, um, you know, he's just amazed. The comet, the story of the comets is unequaled in any other city. You could look at Hershey. That's owned by a corporation. Yeah. It's not they got nothing in it. You know, they have no chance of losing money. The comets all should have gone out of business about four times. Yeah. And they just hung on and just hung on and just hung on. I mean, people forget how much the Franke struggled in the late 90s when the IHL was losing its mind. Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, they had liens on their houses. You know, that was serious stuff. Yep. And now everybody thinks they're so rich and everything. It's like, you guys have no flipping idea <laughs> of what the reality is. Yeah. You know. The behind the scenes of minor league hockey. In a market like this is what nobody would in ever. In any imagine. market, in yeah. any market, but especially here because, you know, you get to see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're the they're the longest tenured owners in minor league sports, mm -hmm. as a family or an individual, except for Hershey. I mean, you think about that. That is, there's like, well, last time I checked, there was like four teams in all of minor league hockey that had owners that had been there ten years or more. Yeah. That's insane. I think it's down to three. Everybody yeah. thinks they're going to get rich. Yep. It is a hang on by the skin of your teeth <laughs> business. Yeah. I always love reading the comments of people like, well, why don't we just pay them more money? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's item of bigger. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah, <laughs> these are because you guys are griping about ticket prices and parking it. And those are legitimate concerns. I'm not uh, saying that those are not, but that's what they got to deal with every day. Yeah. You know, and, and, and they do not the own the building. You know, Kalamazoo can hang on because they own the building. That's a right off. Toledo, <laughs> same deal. They control the building. I mean, there's so many more things you can do when you control the building or own the building. You know, uh, look at the Pepsi Coliseum. I mean, yeah. you know, there's so many things you can do when you have the flexibility to do it, and they don't. I'm so glad you called it the Pepsi Coliseum because I still I know, do that I know. Too. exactly. <laughs> I, yeah. I called it that when I was down there last year for a game, and I got ripped into by a little old lady. Oh, it's the farmer's coliseum, and I was like, I don't see a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but you can smell one. Yeah, yeah I see other things down there. <laughs> I, I've skated on the ice and played there when it was a dump. Yeah, that place was awful. They did such a great job on that building. Yeah, but 
But yeah, you're right. The history here is just. And that's what I was trying to to capture in my books. And really, um, anyway, so after Legends of the Comets, Bob asked me to help on his book, um, which is called Live from Radio Ringside. And to be honest, that was the hardest book to write because uh, I would give Bob, <laughs> this is going to sound awful, <laughs> I would give Bob a list of 10 things every week. We'd meet every week, and I'd say, Bob, this is what we're going to talk about next week. Think about these 10 things. <laughs> and I'd show up the next week, and we, we always met for like three, four hours at a time. And he'd like, I put that list here somewhere. Where is it? I can't find that list. Murph, did you move that list? Every freaking week. <laughs> <laughs> and he never did it. And I'd call him halfway through the week. You started looking at your list? Yeah, yeah, I was doing that today. Sure you were. You know. <laughs> so everything was off the top of Bob's head. And so I'm going back to, this isn't right. This isn't how this happened. You know, I mean, and, and I was always trying to correct it and, and stuff. And we thought when we started, we have three volumes. We ended up with one because I just, we couldn't go any further because it's like he started telling me the same stories over and over. And I'm like, Bob, we did this uh, three months ago. But it's better this time. <laughs> and I'm like, Bob, I'm not wasting the three hours we did, you know, because it takes me 10 hours for every yeah. three that he was, we were talking, you know. Yep. And I'm like, Bob, I'm not recreating that work. We're not making that much money, you know. And, <laughs> and it was just funny. And um, and then I, we've updated that. I think I gave you guys copies of it. Yeah. Um, we updated, I updated that after Bob's passing to complete it. And uh, Shane's part of it, and there's some other people part of it. Karen Wallenstein, his daughter's part of mm -hmm. it. Um, there's 17 more chapters that, that finish it off. And um, that's available on Amazon right now. The old, the first version is not anymore. A funny story, this is what it was like doing this book. Bob would not let us use a picture of it for the cover. Did not want it to happen. Huh. So I reached out to Andy Nichols and said, Andy, Help me here. <laughs> I mean, rescue me. Because we couldn't use Comet's logo. Yeah. And that's why the Chuck's fireball is, is covered up and Robbie's mask and, you know, um, things like that. And so Andy came up with this, which Bob loved, which was, that was great. Yeah. Just loved it. Bob was gone this time. I got to do whatever I dang well wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got with Andy again. And this shows you how far Andy's come. Yeah. I mean, this is remarkable. I mean, uh, we could sell posters of this. Absolutely. You know, that's how great Andy is. And, but it's 20, it's, you know, it's 10, 20 years later, you know, which is just yeah. amazing. And I'm so proud of Andy and Angel uh, North, um, is, uh, is my artist or is my designer. Yeah. And she's just wicked. I mean, she's just amazingly great. And, uh, they make my books 20% better. And, and my copy editor, uh, Melody, uh, Foreman, She's another twenty percent, and then pretty soon I'm just gonna make it insignificant. So you can't have mine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's just the guy. That does the work. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. I just do the grunt work. So we're also uh, we're we're doing. Uh, um, Shane is is working on an audio book. Um, oh, nice. And it's it's available now. It's on BobChaseBook.com. So okay. you've got Shane reading the best stories from the book. And Turner Watson does the second half, and uh, um, and it's available. It's going to be down. It's a downloadable audiobook. I'm not allowed to say a book on tape anymore. I guess. <laughs> you know, I told you how old a I tape. am. Tape. Yeah, that? exactly. <laughs> Shows you how old I am. So, um, so that's those are available at BobChaseBook.com. So, and then you know, Thanksgiving Day is the Bob Chase Memorial Game. Yep. Yeah. One of my favorite things that comics have ever done. And, and I love those jerseys. The new jerseys are awesome. They are sweet. All right, Don. We talked about the jerseys last night. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> well, you don't get me started on that. Why? Come on. It's a Bob Chase Memorial game, a Bob Chase jersey. Yeah. There's no picture of Bob Chase. Yeah, there is. It's on his shoulder boards. You can't see it. Yeah, and Bob would have loved that. I understand. I you know, you got it. You got to be respectful to Bob, what Bob would have wanted. You know, correct. That's like well, all maybe, these maybe people. a radio, like a, a, a yeah, microphone like, on the on the front. That's possible. Or, you know, you know I mean, something. They're gonna do this for fifty years. Correct. There's plenty more jerseys. Yeah, I know. I just, I don't know. And that's like the people who talk about a statue. Bob he and I talked about a statue. He did not want one. Yeah, he was adamant about it. And Shane yeah. and I talked to Bob about it, and 
Bob was like, oh, hell no. I am not going to be head and shoulders above all the other veterans that that building memorializes. Yeah. It was absolutely effing no. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, that, that hopefully that'll be the end of that because, yeah. I mean, he would come back and kick my butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh. I like the New Jersey just because they're that old school style. Yes. I think it's awesome. I, I like the style. I, I do. I just, I don't know. I mean, you know, if you look at it in the Nickelodeon night, it's got Nickelodeon crap all over the front of it. They bought it. You know. They paid for it. I, I guess. I mean, the Comets are paying for this, and they're trying to be right. respectful to Bob's name. Correct. I you know. know. I, it's a no-win deal. I understand. I understand. Somebody's going to say it's too much, and somebody's going to say it's not enough. So, I mean. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the day Bob died. Me and Gary and the guys kneeling at, at, at center ice. I mean, I I, I, I choked up. I mean, I, I'm not. Well, I mean, yeah. how could you not? I remember I was at my wife's uh, parents for Thanksgiving that morning. I was so stressed out that whole freaking day. Yep. I mean, we had been there the night before till midnight. Luckily, all the family got in. You know, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a. I remember it was a brutal day. I remember Gary texted me. Gary, or, I think it was Gary, texted me and told told me, and I was like, I was in my in laws, and I just started crying, and I was like, man, you mean Gary, your dad? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I didn't see that. Did somebody, somebody started ripping. I think it was a burner account or something. I was like, oh, your dad's coaching in China. And I was like, that's cool. Yeah, why didn't you my go dad to your dad in like China? Four when he had me then. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's only place. one one bloodline of Grams in the world. Yeah, <laughs> so, I thought the guy's owns the crackers. Oh yeah, I yeah. Tell them when I tell people how to spell it, I'm like thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I sell them. It's like the car, which I get no money for. You know. <laughs> you don't drive a Sebring, do you? No, heck no. Thank God they're junk. Not many people drive them for long. <laughs> no. Yeah, I had one. My aunt actually has one out now. She married, so her name is now Wallace, but she has one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that's a little weird. They, uh, <laughs> I used to work for an auto parts store, and it's the worst battery change I've ever had. Huh. All right, you time. you you want to take this one, like Sure. This question here. Uh, how do we keep the documented the documented history of the comments without you? I think Justin does a good job. Um, I really do. I mean, it is not easy to do. I mean, and one thing I always try to keep in mind that if I was covering the comments and I was in charge of covering the comments, I had all 67 years were my responsibility. So when somebody passed, you know, I tried to keep up on that kind of thing. Um, That's a lot of players. If their kids you know, we're playing somewhere, that kind of thing. I mean, if they were doing a fundraiser for something, that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it was it was exhausting at times, um, but it was kind of like, even now, Tommy Miracle passed. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I love Tommy Miracle. He was a fantastic guy. I don't know anybody that's ever said a bad word about Tommy Miracle unless they went to Southside because he went to Northside. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that hit me. Um, Tommy was friends with my dad long before I was ever friends with him. He used to work for my dad at the higher store in Bluffton. And he and Del Helby would drive down every day with my dad to Bluffton. And they had the funniest stories. I mean, it's amazing they didn't get pulled over about 10 times a week. You know, the three of them. I mean, they'd be throwing stuff out the window and laughing and, you know, and. Uh, and uh, for yeah. people that don't know, Tommy Miracles just passed away last week, right? Yeah, like he was the, uh, well, now the Zamboni driver for the Tampa Bay Lightning, and uh, which was a harder job than you think. One, it's in Florida, two, it sits on the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, yeah the community hurts that ice big time. Another. I've been in that arena many times, yeah, and he babies that ice. I mean, he he would be you know 18 hours a day during the season babying that ice. Especially when you think about the playoffs go till June, oh, and right. they were in the finals oh, twice. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, we were crazy. Home last year. Uh, my wife's a huge Lightning fan, and uh, we try to go to a game every year down there if we're lucky enough to get down that way. Yeah, and, uh, that ice is. You, you met him, right? Yeah, yeah. The ice is. I think he, I think he knew everybody coming down to yeah. see Lightning game. I mean, one well, form or another. Oh, I know he's amazing that way. I mean, yeah. and I'm sure did he give you something besides yeah. a ration of crap? Yeah, he gave me a slap on the back. Uh, thanks for coming and a t-shirt. There you go. I mean, that's that's Tom. I mean, okay. you know, one of the greatest guys. Uh, and 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 I how do I say this? Tommy deserves something yeah. when he passed. And as much as I don't enjoy writing the obituaries, 
I don't want anybody else to do it either. Yeah. I want to, and I'm not saying that Justin couldn't or won't or wouldn't do it. I want to do it. You know, yeah. I mean, these are personal to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they need to be handled a certain way. Definitely. And so I try to, when, when those things happen, I try to still do them. Nice. So here's another question. Uh, for the same people, Susan and Bill. Yeah. Uh, what who, who? I don't know those people at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, uh, no, they are. You know the story behind Sue and Bill? See, and this is what I loved about covering the team, was getting to meet people like Bill and Sue who are just, you could say top class, class A. They're like 10 steps above that. Yeah. And I still keep in touch with them. We go to lunch. You know, we just, it, they're just amazing friends. Um, they're the ones who took their jersey collection yeah. and gave them back to yeah. retired players mm -hmm. free of charge. Nothing, didn't need anything. That was incredible. I mean, and those are the stories that I really like to tell. Yeah. Uh, about the, 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 the couple who live in Tennessee and drive up every weekend for home games. You know, I mean, the things like that. God, those were fun. I mean, when I found those <clears throat> stories like that, it was like, oh my God, step back. I got this one. I stay away. I don't want nobody bugging me. Let me do this. You know, I mean, and that's Bill and Sue. I mean, they're just class. Yep. They've been our biggest supporters since we started. They've, they've been there since day. They want to come today. Yeah. I told them, yeah. I was like, if I have room. Yeah. We're, we're kind of sitting in each other's lap. Um, hey, wait, that's a, that's a metaphysical term. It's not actually happening. <laughs> This is not that kind of business. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but okay. <laughs> All right. So they want to know, in your opinion, what do you think Bob would say about Ben Pedro? Oh, he'd love him. Yeah. Bob, Bob, lo Bob loved Gary. Yeah. Bob, I mean, Gary was Bob's uh, fourth son. I mean, he really was. Gary would listen to Bob like he would listen to no other because he respected Bob that much. Um, yeah, I mean, but Bob, Bob, I mean, Bob and I have both, you got to remember, Bob and I have known Benny since he was, what, four? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, and I always followed his career, and hell, I remember almost getting blindsided by a skateboard coming down the ramp, going in to talk to his dad in the office, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, literally, <coughs> so proud of Benny. I mean, and, I, and I'm even more, and this is not in any way to denigrate Benny, but I'm even more part of Olivia. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Olivier has made made himself into a legitimate hockey player, made himself into a coach. He's done every stinking dirty job there is. And so is Benny, mm -hmm. you know. And those two are like brothers. Yeah, they're best friends. They they're, are just. We, when we had them both. I think the their show. wives are jealous. Right. You, you can know? tell. I mean, you can just tell. Yeah. You I mean, they have immense respect for each other. And uh, they're going to do great things. I mean, they're going to make mistakes. Uh, of course, and you still and you kind of need him to, you know. I mean, it's part of the deal, you know. You don't learn if you don't make. Oh my gosh, I mean, no. Well, and it's funny we were talking earlier about how the teams quite possibly went from the oldest team in the league to quite possibly the youngest. Yeah, they're gonna make a lot of mistakes, and you know. Then, I mean, we have the youngest coaching staff. I mean, you got Sid and AJ as your leaders. I mean, come on, you're gonna make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Especially, especially if they follow those two off the ice. You know, I mean, then they're in real trouble. Binks has his hands full there. <laughs> That's another guy I'm super proud of too. Yes, Binkley. Yes. Yeah, I was so happy to see him go up there and get an assist. Yes. And then he got robbed and sent right back. Yeah. Oh, that's the that's, that's, that's the deal. The day, though. I mean, let no. Let's face it. There's a reason these guys are in the E. There really is. I mean, mm -hmm. they're too big or, or up there or they're too fast or they're too smart or they're – there's all – it's all circumstances. You know, it really is. I remember when Sid was with Grand Rapids or Cleveland and they came in and played an AHL exhibition game here. Yeah. And Sid was the smallest forward on the ice by a mile. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't mean he was any less talented, but, it, I mean, it stood out that he was significantly smaller than those guys. You know, I mean, there's a – everybody's here for a reason. I watched Sid play in Charlotte. I was randomly in town when he got called up uh, 2016. And I told my buddy I was staying with, I was like, I got to go to this game. Yeah. And I was like, it's kind of – and my buddy's from Fort Wayne. He lives down there for work. So we went down there, and Sid looked like a midget. Yeah. But, boy, he skated around everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, 
it's, it's a tough deal. I mean, then you've got the number situation, who's on NHL contract, how many spots they got, oh, all yeah, that. Well, yeah. you know, who's coming back from injury? When you get with two affiliates. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's you know, part of the business. Been, it's been fun this year to follow all of them, though. For fun us. for now. Yeah. Give, well, it a, give it half a season, you'll be sick to death of it. <laughs> well, I'm getting to that point now. You know, what I hate is when at the end of the season, you've got a guy who's been here all year busting his hump. And then he gets ripped away. And he gets ripped away. Or, sorry, we can't put you on the playoff roster. we got guys that are coming back. Mm-hmm. And what do you do? You take the guys that are coming back. You have, have no to. choice. You have to. Yeah. I hate that part of it. That happened to Manchester last year. We've talked about that a few times. That they made the Eastern Conference Finals, and Ontario ripped all their guys away. Yeah. And, and that's, they were screwed. How many times have you seen – an AHL goalie get hurt. Oh, there goes your playoff goalie right like that. Yep. Yeah. And how do you prepare for that? And everybody jumps on the ownership or the general manager or whatever. You should have been prepared. How the hell do you prepare for that? <laughs> yeah. it's, One, there's so many yeah. more things other than skill that go into winning a playoff team. Well, can't they just go find a goalie? Sure. Come on. I'll see. You. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You got any extra pads, spare pads? Yes. Want to know Joe is not coming out of the locker room for this. You know? <laughs> So you were covering that game, right? No, actually I wasn't. I was covering a volleyball game. Oh, actually, man. no, that was during the time I took a year and a half off. I they they promoted me, kicked me upstairs because mm-hmm. the staff was changing. They wanted me to be the assistant <clears throat> and do some more teaching. And sure. that's when I wrote uh, Tales of the Comets and Legends of the Comets. Okay. During that time. Uh, so no, I was not there for that game. That sucks. Hmm. Eh. Came out with a good book though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Everything happens for a reason. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if if I don't know that if I hadn't done that, if I wouldn't have written any books. True. But yeah. what happened was uh, Joe Shibley had passed away. And Joe and Kerry Hubbard were the guys who convinced me to take over the comments after Bud. I'm like, yeah, right. Yeah, that's funny. That, tell me another one. You know, that's real funny. Who wants to follow Bobby Knight? Who wants to follow Bud Gallmire on comments? You know I mean? Yeah. I'm not stupid. You know what I mean? <laughs> And they're like, no, you got no choice, okay? You're doing it. <laughs> and it's like, oh, crap, you know. But so Joe passed away, and I knew I always wanted to write a book about the comments. And I knew I was going to mention Joe in the book. And that was really what, all right, quit talking about it and just do it, damn it. You know I mean? Quit farting around and making up excuses and just do it. Yep. And then I loved it so much, I just kept going. That's really awesome. So, and I mentioned Joe, and I mentioned Carrie in the forward for that. So, how many years did you cover the comments in overall? 28. 28? So, in your 28 years, we have this question on every sure. everyone. What was your least favorite arena that you went into to cover? Um, And why? Probably, maybe Dayton. <laughs> ah, yeah, there you go. Everybody. Just because I worried about my car each time you're going in and leaving. <laughs> um, and... and but it wasn't that bad. I mean, it was worse than the old sports arena. Uh, nothing was worse than the old sports arena, but I didn't cover a game there. Oh, you never got to cover one there. Uh-uh. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I never worried about the arena. You know, I really yeah. didn't. You know, um, I guess least favorite place overall. Going again. to Atlanta was always hard because the Omni back then, before the Olympics, was a one-way street in. Yeah. And it took you four times as long to get out of there as it did going in. And they made the worst ice in the world because they always had to squeegee the ice like three times a period. You know, it was a horseshit place to play hockey. And uh, I remember going down there for the finals. Yeah. And was it 92? 94. Yeah, because 93 we won, 94 they lost. Yeah. And uh, we went down there. They were building the Olympic Village. Right. In 94. And... uh, you could tell it was a basketball arena. Oh, yeah. You could I totally mean, tell. It. You see the rats and stuff. And, <laughs> and the thing of it is, the best game I ever saw the Comets play, the best hockey game I ever covered was in 93. Everybody discounts this game because it was on the road, and not that many Fort Wayne fans were there. But game two <laughs> in Atlanta was the best game I ever saw the Comets play. And it beats out game seven in Indy. It beats out game seven against Rockford. It beats out game seven against Port Huron, even though that was triple OT. That was not a very good game. No, it was sloppy. This was a spectacular hockey game with both teams playing at their absolute best and hardest. And the Comets won, I think it was two to one. Uh, John Mark Richard and Scott Gruel, Colin Chin was on the faceoff. 
and they flip positions and, and JM went to play forward off the face off on a power play and they got the puck back to Scotty on the point. He was wide open. He just drilled. It. And it was little things like that that made all the difference in that game. And I'll never forget the locker room in that game. It was so stinking hot in there. It was like a sauna after the game and Colin comes out and it's right underneath the bleachers and he's leaning against the steel bar and the bleachers. He's just like, I can't talk. I can't breathe. You know what I mean? <laughs> they were so exhausted from playing that game. And that was the game that told me they were going to do it, you know, and uh, they were just, that was the hardest played game I'd ever seen. Uh, game seven against Indy, they were, both sides were so exhausted after three overtime games and three nights, they had nothing left. They were using their sticks to hook the opponent down the ice because they knew the ref wouldn't call anything in overtime. They were getting towed down the ice. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were just, and they were super exhausted. They were, jag they too. were dragging. Yeah. And you got, you got Larry. What do you think we have? Oh, oh Larry. Okay. Hey, okay. Larry. Oh, man. Uh, thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. Um, uh, it's, uh, I miss Larry. I miss Shane. I miss Fitzy tonight. I miss those guys, you know, going up. I always got to the games two hours before you. And I would stick my head in the door and say, hey, what's the lineup changes tonight? Um, you know, just shoot the bull. And um, I miss those guys in the massage room, you know, talking to those guys before the game and stuff and, and watching Steve working on them and and then go upstairs at least an hour and a half early and, and just shoot the bull with Fitz and, and Fick and all those guys, the opposing broadcasters, Chuck Bailey. And we had the best time up there with Shane and Larry and so much fun i mean just so much fun trading memories and we try to trivia questions to stump each other stuff like that you know and so much fun we've done that with larry a few times oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and sometimes larry even knows what he's talking about too every now and then he's pretty good at bullshit his way through it he is. <laughs> and if you think about it larry's been a fan or been affiliated with the team longer than my 28 years by like 10. you yeah, know and yeah. and shane's you know that's one of the cool things about the comments is I never, I never claimed to be the expert, but I knew who to ask. Mm -hmm. You know, you could ask Gwen Rude, you could ask Ken Rares, or you could ask Stan Bratmiller, or you could ask uh, any of the Zimmermans. Oh my gosh, I mean, the first family of Fort Wayne hockey, the Zimmermans. Um, or you could ask Larry or Shane, and eventually you'd come up with a consensus. Or you could call Mr. Memory Eddie, and, and he'd tell you. <laughs> and uh, he does. He remembers everything. It's in, he's nuts, and he knows it in a good way. You know, I mean. Uh, or George, you know, I mean, there's there's guys that have been there from the beginning, which is just unreal. And that Jesus. was part of the reason. Two years, Larry said. Oh, yeah. Jesus. And that's part of the reason I wrote, uh, where is it here, uh, the sports history book. I wrote the Fort Wayne sports history book because we'd already lost Bud, and we lost Hilliard, and we lost uh, uh, Len um, Davis, you know, and we'd lost all these significant people. We lost Jim Costin, you know, and I wrote this before we lost Bob. But we were going to lose all those people and all those memories. Yep. And I wanted to put all those stories in one place just so we wouldn't lose them. Um, I don't care about getting the credit for it, but there's some amazing things that have happened in Fort Wayne sports history that we cannot afford to lose. Yeah. And so that's why I wrote this book, which is – I always thought if I was going to write a Fort Wayne sports history book, it would be like – 5,000 pages and I have to charge 50 bucks for it. <laughs> and then I woke up one day and I said, well, let's put it in a calendar. So each day, each date gets one page. And, and then that page is limited to 350 words. So, oh, that makes it a lot easier, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, a lot of common stuff is in here too. Um, but there's so many amazing things that have happened. I mean, national and international things that have happened in Fort Wayne. The first NBA All-Star game not to be played in Boston is in Fort Wayne. The first Major League Baseball game is in Fort Wayne. I mean, there's just remarkable things that happened in Fort Wayne. I mean, there was an All-Star game in here where the Globetrotters played uh, the uh, uh, college All-Stars. Yeah. What would that game be worth today? That would be on ESPN in the summer, mm -hmm. and it'd be spectacular. They played it at Zoner Stadium just for the heck of it to see if they could do it. You know, I mean, things like that are just remarkable. Once-in-a-lifetime things, not even mentioning the Comet Sweep or St. Francis and what they've done and uh, IPFW Volleyball. I mean, oh, 
Yeah. Bypass High is playing for the national title, you know. Yep. That was remarkable. Uh, Lloyd playing in four Olympics and winning a gold medal. Matt, uh, just, it's incredible. Um, Sharon Rickman and, uh, uh, oh, man, I can't believe I forgot his name. Matt uh, Swimmer won it in 70, 76. And, and uh, I mean, I still keep in track with all, but anyway, that list is in the back of the book, too. Um, so I, it's 365 pages for the, the stuff. And then in the back, I get all kinds of things, like how many exhibition games were played in Fort Wayne with major league teams, how many NBA games were played here, how many NHL games were played here. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, Matt Vogel. Gosh darn it. How many Olympians we got, which is more than you'd ever think. The career scoring leaders for football and basketball, the career rushing Larry, leaders Larry for football. Larry had a lap name for you. Yeah, I know. You win it, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Something. Yeah, yeah. You know, all the state champions for high school, all the Hall of Fames, things like that. So my goal is kind of, and it's, I'm not going to do it, but hopefully someday somebody puts together a Fort Wayne Athletic Hall of Fame, and awesome. they can use this as a basis to start with. That needs to happen. I have another book I'd like to think about doing, which is Fort Wayne's Greatest Athletes, and do that in like an encyclopedia style with bios and things. But again, that might be five thousand pages too. So we'll see. You know, I mean, that'll be a retirement project. That might be a hundred dollar book there. Yeah, yeah, that'll be a retirement project. Uh, what league do you think we played the best in? Uh, I love the IHL, and I'm not talking the original. I'm talking the second one. I love that really? league. Oh yeah, absolutely. The Sixteen league. You knew everybody on the other teams. You did. You, saw you don't know anybody on these teams. Not unless they're in the division. How much fun was it getting on? Uh, uh, Larry and Jim Sterling. from Flint and, oh, and, and Larry Sterling. Yeah, I mean you knew and those guys, and they played against it, and they played up to it. Oh yeah, they did. Uh, Night Art, uh, you know all those guys. You knew all of them. You knew who they were. You knew about them. You knew, uh, you knew if they got hurt. They came here. Yeah. You knew if they got hurt if they were coming in that week. Mm -hmm. I mean. You knew everything about them. That made it more fun. You knew the opposing coaches on a first name basis. I knew everybody in every front office. I could call them up once a week and just shoot the bull for a half hour. And it was never anything nefarious or anything. It was just like, hey, what's going on? Yeah. You know, and they trusted me. You know, I like the Central League because of that too. It was about the same. Yeah, I love the Central more. League. The Central League was was great to me. And, uh, but I love, I could go up and call Jim or, or Larry at home and say, Hey, how you doing? What's going on? I want to do this story. What do you think? And they would trust me. Yeah. You know, I could do that all the time. You know, I always went to every locker room. I didn't just go to the comments locker room. Mm -hmm. I talked to the referees, you know, I would tell, uh, remember when, uh, when Brett Thiessen in, in Kansas city did the, uh, after the Comets lost the first two games here and everybody was saying conspiracy theory because the Comets were leaving. Yeah. And we got to Kansas City and Comets won game three and he was sitting outside clapping, saying conspiracy theory. And I thought he was exactly right. Yeah. That was such horse shit mm -hmm. that, that even came up. And I, I, I called the CHL commissioner and I said, I want to, uh, I want to talk to him, but I don't, I don't want you to find him. If you find him, I'll pay it. Even. Yeah. I mean, I think this is an important story. And I called Brett and, uh, because he trusted me, he told me what he was thinking and all that. And I wrote this story about what crap it was. Because you know what? Kansas Missouri Mavericks get paid too. Yeah. You know, they deserve it too. You yeah. know? And uh Charlie Effinger. Oh my God, that was the best series I'd ever seen by a goalie. I remember Effie. Oh, that was he was an amazing guy. Great and I and I go talk to him and he wasn't even hadn't even been here yet. He was here the next year, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I, because I went and talked to all these guys all the time, people trusted me. And, uh, and Brent wrote, we wrote this story and the commissioner sent me a bill for like 50 bucks or something, you know, <laughs> and it was, it was hilarious. It was just, no, it was great. He, he loved it. I mean, he goes, thank you so much for having the, the courage and the integrity to tell the truth, you know? Yeah. And, and it was funny because Tom Barry, who was the commissioner of the IHL way back in the day. Yeah. And I'm still close with Tom. And um, he sent Dwight um, a uh, a note when the comments joined. He goes, this is one guy you can trust. If if he screws it up, you let me know. I will take care of it. You know, and I never did, you know, because I, I valued that trust, you know. 
And that's why I was able to get so many stories because people did trust me. And it wasn't like I was just talking to them for the first time when something happened either. Right. You know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I stood outside the door of the referee's room and say, I'm not here to judge. I just want what's the explanation for X so I can explain it to the fans. Yeah. I'm not making any judgments, and they knew I didn't. I never did. Mm -hmm. uh, I might later on say something about, you know, but this was the explanation. So at least we had the explanation. It wasn't just he just made it up, you know. But I talked to all the referees. So whenever there was a story about a referee, I got it, you know, because the, the leagues would trust me, on, right. you know, and things like that. Um, yeah, I try to be, I try to talk to everybody. I mean, how many times do we do stories about Paul the Zamboni driver, you know what I mean? <laughs> and stuff and him waving to his grandkids and, you know, and things like that. And uh, I'll never forget when uh, Tim and Greg were doing Sabre for the Fury and, and uh, Tim fell and broke his back. And I talked to him because I talked to them all the time, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And they were honest with me and they were open about it. And Greg showed me the the scabs on his hands where he was trying to hold the rope, you know, and uh, it just, you know, there was so much more going on at a hockey game than just play on the ice. Oh yeah. That's what people don't realize. The casual fans don't, they'll never understand. And those are the best stories. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, telling stories about Gary uh, doing fireworks because that's how he supported his family when he was making his way up the chain to be a coach. Yep. Uh, uh, John Torchetti driving cab in in Winston Salem, North Carolina, because that's how he could afford it. Olivier driving do, Uber, doing Uber and Lyft, you know, because yeah. that's how he could support his family. Anything to keep the dream alive, you know. Things like stories off the ice were so much better normally than stories on the ice. But you got you got Pascal Morency, yeah, coming up next, next week. Yeah, yep. he's gonna come on and talk about mental health in a game and addiction in the game and love pascal man what a fantastic guy my best pascal morency story was the a game that it was a sunday afternoon game and uh, i think i put the final score in the last paragraph and nobody said a word <laughs> because pascal scored a goal he scored the first goal of the game or the second goal i can't it was the game winning goal and he just went absolutely nuts. He was throwing himself up against the glass. He was swinging a stick around. I mean, he was like, what in the heck? I didn't know that guy. You know, it was the third game in three nights, and he was losing his mind. And so I tracked down the story. I didn't even, I didn't pay any attention to the rest of the game. Uh, Taylor Mills, who was born with a, a couple of birth defects, and she's like missing half a leg and half an arm and some fingers on the other arm, I believe. And I'm doing this all from memory, so... I'm sorry, Taylor, if I screwed it up. Um, she was like seven, eight. Well, they would bring Taylor through the locker room towards the end of the season on a Sunday after three games and three nights. And it was like, yeah. this is why you guys are playing for people like this. And Pascal happened to be the last guy she saw before she went out the door. Well, the night before, Pascal had been suspended. Yep. And so she crawled up the stairs, literally crawled up the stairs into the upper deck to go sit with him because that was her favorite player. And she sat with him that game. And the next day she comes through the locker room and he's the last guy she sees. And he goes, I'm going to score a goal for you tonight. And I'm like, you dumbass, promise her a fight. You could win that. You know? <laughs> you know? So he goes out and scores a goal and just loses his mind. And he flips the puck to Sean Dunnan who stuck it outside and they got it to Taylor. And so I find Taylor and we go to a corner somewhere and she tells me her story. She's got the puck. And I'm like, you got to come with me after the game. We're going to get Pascal to sign it. So after the game, I think the comments won two to one or two to nothing. I don't even remember. I really don't care. You know, yeah. after the game, we've got Taylor sitting on Pascal's lap on the bench. I've, I've convinced the photographer, I think it was Ellie Bogue, to stay because we've got this amazing story. And she's taking pictures and Ellie's crying and I'm crying and Pascal's crying and Taylor's just sitting there laughing at us, <laughs> you know, and it's just the most amazing story. I think I, I think I want a state award for it. I don't remember for sure, but it was like, and the, st the score is in like the last, oh yeah, they won. Oh yeah, by the way. <laughs> you know, it was so irrelevant yeah. to everything that happened. So ask Pascal next week about, about Taylor. Definitely and I still right. keep up with Taylor. She won a, she was playing golf at uh, Wayne. And uh, she was playing golf at, at, 
at uh, St. Francis. I mean, she's just an amazing person. Uh, she's an amazing person no matter what's going on with her physically. Yeah. Love that kid. And I caught up with her a couple of years ago, and we did a story and again. And I mean, she's just an amazing person. But those are the kind you love to tell. Those are the kind of stories that kind of tell themselves, and you just get the heck out of the way. You know, um, those are the ones that really they tear me up. Yeah. But they're so much fun to tell. I got okay. right. another one, huh? I got uh, Jean. Oh, there you go, bud. <laughs> um, it's kind of a long one to read, so maybe you should read it. You want me to? Yeah. All right. It says, "Tell me who it's from." It's from uh, Stephen Sidlowski, Sean's dad. Sean's dad. It says, "Thanks for all you've done over the years, Blake. Some great stories and articles. Always will cherish the Gordy Howe. <laughs> or, or always cherish the Gordy Howe. Would be proud of Sean Sidlowski, one of the biggest nutcases on and off the ice you've ever witnessed." <laughs> <laughs> but the story behind that is, is Sean had six fights where he's in the games, six games where he had a fight, a goal, and an assist. Gordy Howe had only two his yeah. whole career. <laughs> And it was the Gordy Howe hat trick. Right. You know, and I had no idea. So I was just like, how many times? He, so I called Mike Emmerich. Mike, how many times did this actually happen? And Mike goes, only two. I said, oh, you're a kid. And you're fooling me. No, only two. I said, Sid's got six. And so that was the story. You know, I mean, I could always call. I could always call uh, uh, Mike. I could call. Uh, oh, man, my memory is shot today. I'm so sorry, folks. The guy, <laughs> Phil Pritchard. Uh, Mr. The, the keeper guy of the cup. cup. Keeper yeah. of the cup. I could call him all the time. Phil and I used to have the most fun, and sometimes Mike too. Is uh, when's the last time this happened? Like, I really almost got him good, except Mike, of course, never forgets a darn thing. No. no when's the last outdoor game that got postponed or couldn't be played that day? And Mike knew immediately because he's been to all of them. You know, remember the Comets in Toledo when the game got rained out? Yeah. yeah and then they there. played the next day. Yeah. And so I called Mike and I called Phil. I got I got a good one for you this time, guys. And Mike knew immediately. He said it was in uh, Washington or Pittsburgh. They were playing the Penguins and the Capitals, and the uh, they were waiting for dark because the sun was melting the ice. <laughs> and, and he's like, "Oh darn it, Mike! I thought I had a good one here, you know." But if they played it that day, it was just delayed. And so we had the first outdoor game in a pro game that had been delayed a day or postpone officially postpone oh, wow. and so we come i mean it was so much fun you know robbie laird's another one we could come up with stuff to stump these guys and it's like you know i knew if those guys couldn't come up with it we had something really good here you know <laughs> something really if those guys guys like that couldn't come up with it brandon faber who was the pr director for the blackhawks during their three cups and now he's the pr uh president for the bears i mean you know there were certain guys around hockey Ficarelli, if Fick didn't remember, or Bob didn't remember, or Eddie didn't remember, we knew I had something good, you know, <laughs> you know. But there's this network of people that it was just it was fun to do all that stuff with. All right, um, how about a hockey murder mystery book to compliment? Our <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna let uh, uh, Sarah do that one. Uh, Sarah's doing one, so I'm gonna let her do that one. <laughs> uh, who's been your favorite fan throughout the years, like Twister or? Bruce and his hard hat. Um, I, don't, I mean, that's hard to say because uh, except for you guys, I try to treat fans equally. I try to treat them all like they're not assholes, you know? Let's <laughs> <laughs> see how it is. No, exactly. but I mean, <laughs> that's pretty good. Right? <laughs> um, you're a hell of a judge of character. <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of this podcast. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there weren't too many fans that I had problems with. I mean, there were a few that made it personal, but of course, screw them. Um, kind of goes with a job. Um, I don't know. I try to, I try to treat all the fans like friends. You know, I mean, I love telling stories about the Janice and 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 the, the her sister and them guys doing the banner every year for the playoffs. Yep. I thought that was cool. I mean, they're just doing it out of the goodness of their hearts for the that's, playoff uh, banner. Oh, that's yeah. Mark's family, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mark's family. I had a heck with Mark. But those his sisters are awesome, you know. <laughs> hey man, I remember some of the arguments we've got in with Mark before. Can you can you, can you, you ever seen play? a bigger turnaround in somebody's life? No. Talk he about is it. such a different person now because of Jennifer. He's so happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And thank God that baby takes after her mother, not him. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's adorable. Yeah, she is. Yeah, she is. Um, but no, I mean, the Mussers, I love the Mussers. I mean, I don't know how to, I mean, 
it, it, I often would get great story ideas from fans and, and follow them up. I mean, that's how I would hear about some of these things. And, uh, and I didn't, I never minded it either. Cause it's like, keep me on my toes, make sure double check. Like Bill and Sue give me ideas, gave me ideas and make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know? I, think I proofread a few things one time and one thirty in the morning. I was like, Oh hell message you're like i'm so tired thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was yeah my hours were insane <laughs> well i knew you were still awake that's why i was like i'll just yeah do that now yeah but i mean everybody sees it in the morning my hours were just <laughs> i mean i'd be working 18 hours a day during yeah. the season I mean, yeah it was insane and then it wasn't just like i was only doing the comments that was always a misconception too yeah everybody thought that's all i was doing it's like no i have like four other beats at the same time you know, and I, I can't, I won't, I will not ignore them either, you know. And you can't, it was, you were really big in tennis, right? Yeah. That's yeah. what I thought. I couldn't remember if it was you, because Coney does the golf more. Yeah. And I would do the tennis, the volleyball, the gymnastics. Um, I always did a lot of girls sports because nobody else wanted to, and I loved it. I mean, I really loved girls sports because you could see a kid start the season, couldn't dribble the ball off yeah. anything off their foot. And then the end of the season, they can make the game when he shot. You know, I mean, they've improved that much. I love covering girls sports. Yeah. So, I mean, I just. Well, it's come so far in the it's last a, oh, 20 years. 30 years. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I mean, you think about it. They used to have to practice at night after the boys were done or early in the morning because that's when the gym was open because yeah. the boys were using it then. Or they'd wear the old boys, uh, they'd wear softball uniforms for basketball games, and they'd wear jean shorts. Yep. You know, because, well, there's no money in the budget for uniforms. You know, yeah. and, and it was somebody's dad coaching because none of the teachers wanted to do it a lot. And, oh, yeah, that just used to tick me off. I mean, just amazing. They ticked me off how they were just treated so unfairly. That's why that. Remember, Bobby Whitman has to use to run cross-country races in Ohio because they weren't sure if she was, Bobby was a guy or a girl and girls weren't allowed to run distance races, you know, things like that. Wow. Just, oh, they did the equity of it. Just drove me up a wall. Well, that's kind of, that's the reason that the title nine stuff came around. Didn't it? Yeah. That was and even then you had that, we had, oh, that was, Before yeah. Really yeah. Came in. But even then we had to hold them accountable to force some of them to do it. Oh yeah. I mean, and I, I love that. I'd like, oh, I'll go with a flamethrower. I don't care. You know, and uh, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. I mean, that was just like these old stereotypical uh, showing his pigs and that crap. <laughs> oh. And nowadays, I mean, what girls can do athletically is, is amazing. It's, it's amazing. You got I mean, girls dunking now and yeah. pro basketball. Yeah. You got Ayanna Patterson at, at Homestead. That girl could be a senator. She could be an astronaut. She could be a professor. She could be anything she wants. And that's besides basketball. Yeah. She's that brilliant of a kid. Her folks are just amazing, and they've done such a wonderful job of her. And I've known Ayanna since she was in the second grade. I mean, I just think the world of that kid. And she's got great coaches now, too. I tried to bring in a guest host because our third wasn't here. And uh, Blaze. Blaze said. I Did, said, isn't he babysitting right now? I don't know. I sent him a message. He didn't answer it. So he was like, uh, I really wish I would have seen Dow's message to join you guys today. I would have loved to chat with you. Hope all's well. Keep keep being a blessing in all you do. Oh, thanks, Blaze. And thanks to you guys. I mean, uh, when I got to meet Montana when she was a baby and now the baby, and it's like, you guys need to keep having kids. They're making such beautiful kids. <laughs> I know that's not happening. but uh, uh, You know, they're just they're just amazing people. They I mean, are. you think about it, they come from Ohio every stinking game, you know what I mean? They're amazing. They are such a blessed family. Yeah, but they only come from Van Horn. I come from Lima. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, has got, it has gotten so much better. Yeah. Oh, it's amazingly better now than what it used to be. Oh, uh, remember the old trip on 24. Yeah, I mean, you never knew when a deer was going to jump out and yeah. commit suicide. I, I hated the, the drive up when we went to like Cedar Point stuff. Yeah. 24. Oh, yeah, that, that was, was worse. worse. Yeah, I used to try so to pass easy to miss, seven. too. I used to try, try to pass six or seven people before you get into our yeah. so, so easy to miss. I'm going to let you drive my truck at 24. Oh, so there's a great question. Will Shark ever be a comments coach? I have made this prediction 10 years ago that whenever David Franke hangs up the general manager thing, whenever he chooses, I think Shrocky will be the general manager. Really? Yes. I told my wife that. And I said that 10 years ago. 
I have tremendous respect for Shrocky and his whole family. A lot of people think because Shrocky's a hockey player and he was a fighter, he's not very smart. The kid's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. The kid is smarter than a whip. He's been a captain wherever he went. He's been a winner wherever he went. He's paying his dues now. He's doing a really good job as a coach. Um, I can't wait to sit down with him after I retire and write his book. <laughs> I just have so much respect for him and his whole family. Um, I hope it's okay to tell this story, parts of this story, Shrocky, and if it's not, I apologize. He and I would sit down every year and say, well, I got this chance to go here or here. And I'd say, you should stay. And that's part of the reason he stayed as long as he did because of his family and his nieces and nephews needed him. And uh, he had such a huge impact here. And it's really worked out well for him. I mean, but we would sit down every year after the season and go, we'd go to uh, TJ Fridays and have lunch, you know, and, <laughs> And um, we talk about it, you know, things like that and, and stuff. And, and I'm so happy he's having such great success. Yeah. And he married he married so far over his head at eight. Funny. Oh, Morgan <laughs> is so awesome. She is like, what is she doing with this loser? You know, I mean, uh, it's just like, it's incredible. I mean, she, and, and you know, there are certain guys who need a female to run their lives for them. Well, there's one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Morgan, God love Morgan. You know, how she puts up with him, I'll never know, you know. Well, when we did our sh a show with Shrocky way back oh, early mm -hmm. summer. Yeah, it was a while ago. Uh, Morgan was just like, don't go anywhere, just come to the house. Oh, cool. And that sounds just, like Morgan, yeah. Yeah, we just hung out of the house and chatted for, I mean, we stayed there for, that was the day we did two shows that day, and we were supposed to do Brian Gratz in the afternoon. Yeah. And we were an hour late to that because we lost track of time just sitting there talking yeah. to those guys. Well, and what's, what's funny is I was always, everybody – some people accuse me of being too friendly with the players. And I'm like, yeah, that's funny. Um, because Guy told me once that I really ripped him for something, not him, but the whole team. He goes, well, we must have had it coming if Blake ripped us, you know. <laughs> and I tell guys, I says, while you're playing, we can be friendly. When you retire, we can be friends. Yeah. And I really try to stick to that. Um, that was how I wrote, uh, where is it here, onto the show, which is about, all the guys, this is probably the hockey book I'm most proud of. Yeah. Um, it's about all the guys <clears throat> who made it to the NHL, either on the way up or on the way back, who played for the Germans. And uh, nine out of ten of them, I just called, and within a day, they called back. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Weeks. Uh, Bruce Booter, obviously Johnny Anderson. I mean Kevin Kaminsky. I still keep in touch with Kevin. Oh, killer! And, and Bruce nice and and uh, all those guys. I tracked down Alton White, the first African American player to play for the Comets, and what a story he had. Um, and it's in here. I mean, he he experienced racism in Fort Wayne uh, because nobody would rent him a house, and the guys rallied around him. The guys and their wives treated that guy like he was gold. And he talks about how what they did for him still affects him to this day. He wanted all their numbers so he could call them and talk to them. And I know he did. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's so many stories like that in here that were so much fun to tell. Um, you know, Will Faber talking about getting his parents to come to the Stanley Cup parades in Chicago because that was once in a lifetime events. And he knew he was probably not going to get another chance again and stuff. I mean, so many personal, personal stories. Uh, Weeksy was here for half a year. Yeah. And he still talks about how Fort Wayne gave him a chance to go to the NHL because yeah. he had been buried. And they were they had gotten rid of him just to get rid of him. Yeah. Get out of our sight. I've, I've heard him I've heard him mention it on the national broadcast yes. a few times. And he just opened his heart about this. And it's not again, these are not guys that I'm just calling them for the first time in 25 years. You know, yeah. I try to keep in touch. I try to send them a note when I see something happen or um, if they they got married or had a kid or something like that. I mean, it was so much more than just hockey. Um, and so they all called me back. I mean, it was just astonishing. Uh, you know, and they all, I mean, Freddie Knipscher is talking about his, his one regret is he never played for the comments, you know, 
he got to the NHL. He played in the stand. He scored a Stanley Cup playoff game-winning goal in overtime, but he misses that he didn't get to play for the Comets. You know, I mean, stuff like that is just golden. That is probably the uh, uh, the maybe the, the hockey book I'm most proud of because there's so many personal personal stories in there, um, and you know, just you just treat them with respect, and they treat you with respect. Yep. I had a cool Kevin Weeks encounter at Wind in Fort Wayne. Uh, we were down in Tampa, and the NHL Network was doing a show. It was in the playoffs, and you know how they set their desks up outside doing yeah, show and yeah. stuff. Well, I a little warm. Yeah, it was warm. <laughs> I love the community though. Um, but anyways, I brought a comments uh, hoodie to wear because. Emily Arena is always freezing. Yeah, it has to be. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm gonna wear a hoodie in. So I put my hoodie on outside and I was walking in. And all of a sudden these big hands just reached right around me. Yeah. And I had never met this guy in my life, but I knew who he was. This was about eight years ago, probably. Six years ago, I don't know. And I turned around, he was there, and he goes, I just want to shake your hand. Nice guy, isn't he? And I was like, What? He goes, That shirt. He goes, No explanation needed. Nice to meet you. Have a good game. And he's dead honest about that. I mean, he's dead serious. I, I swear I could call him right now and I'd hear back from him by tomorrow yeah. if I needed it. And all I would say is, hey, I really need you. And, it, you know, or, you know, I always, I never take advantage of it. I never say, hey, I'm just calling to get you to call me back. You know, I don't do that. I say, here's what I'm working on and I've got a deadline and they'll get back to me. You yeah. Know? Uh, uh, Bruce, right now, he's coaching Minnesota. He, if I needed any call back. I, I ran into Bruce and with him a few weeks ago. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Minneapolis. Doesn't surprise me at all. I was up there picking up a boat for a buddy of mine to bring back. Me and my dad, my dad was with me, and we went in to a uh, brewery up there. And I turned the corner, and I was like, oh, shit. Like, There's Ben's dad. And dad goes, oh, nice. <laughs> that tells you how far we've come and how yeah. old I am. <laughs> <laughs> he, goes, he goes, no, it's not. And I was like, watch this. So I just walked up, and I was like, hey, Gabby. And he turned, he goes, and I had a comments hoodie on. He goes, oh, hell. <laughs> <laughs> we sat and talked for a good while. He doesn't shut up, does he? No, there's a reason he has a nickname. <laughs> and, and the amazing thing is, none of it's cliches. No. Not one damn word is a cliche. Everything's different. Everything is amazingly open, first rate, you know. And was Crystal with him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He married over his head, too, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Well, it was funny because I texted Ben earlier that day, and I was like, hey, man. I mean, I kind of thought he would know Minneapolis a little bit, you know? Yeah, no. Huh? Nothing. Never he been goes, there. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I've never been in there. I've been there, either, there. <laughs> but uh, I was like, because I texted him, I was like, what's the good places to go? Like, we're here. And then the thing he came back with is, I've never been there. Been to Woodbury. That's it. He goes, is it cold? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. It's hilarious. It's yeah. Minneapolis. What do you yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um. I learned so much from Bruce and John. I mean, you got to remember when I took over the team in 1990, I'd been to like three games, you know, just as a fan, yep. totally as a fan, didn't pay attention, you know. Um, and I didn't really know much about hockey. I remember uh, Al Sims saying, yeah, we got a chance to trade for Scott Grohl. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Who's he? You know, oh, wow. I didn't know. I wasn't, I was a very casual at the best. One of the most hated people yes. to come in here to become loved. Oh, but Scott and, and John and Bruce and Chinner and, oh, I mean, just all those guys. Louis Fletch, uh, Bobby J, Danny Lambert, all those guys taught me so much. And they were so patient with me because I'd asked a lot of dumb questions. I mean, a lot of dumb questions. Uh, Herdsey, all those guys. I mean, now that's a fun guy to talk to. Oh. On or off the ice, yeah, and he married at six miles over his head too, you know. Uh, um, but you know those guys are just amazing people, and and it's, I wish my one regret is I wish I'd have been on the beat five years longer at that point because then I really would have appreciated what was going on. Yeah, because it was all it was all so new to all of us. I mean, people talk about how the comments were golden that year. They were drawing 4,500 fans a game. They didn't get hot until the playoffs yeah. in the community. Now, it wasn't it wasn't an event until they played Indianapolis. And if they hadn't played in Indianapolis, it might not have ever happened. Yeah. Because they Whitey Stapleton and Colin get in the stick fight the Wednesday before the playoffs <laughs> start in Indianapolis. You know, uh, Mad Max, all those guys. I mean, you know, 
and they were just tremendous people and um they really did love each other i mean boise uh oh just all those guys it was just unbelievable um jm and and uh sid you know um you know they loved talking about that year too and it was so funny because when they won a cup in 93 i remember chinner and scotty and and uh, jm and a couple guys saying that the 91 team was better yeah that they were better than the team that swept but they just had to play peoria which was exceptional jim told me that at the alumni party yeah and i asked him I was like so how was it playing back then he goes well 91 was better yeah and they all they all they're all still brothers yeah i mean if any one of them needs anything they're there like that yep and they all keep in touch you know killer uh, Bowser, you know, all those guys, they're still, you know, it could be 50 years and they'd be like, they served together in World War II type yeah. thing. You know, I mean, it, that bond is there, you know, it's cemented. It was really neat for us because when we had the alumni party, you had the different groups like Kaylee and Olivier were talking together and we had them go up together and talk. And then it was um, Ron Leaf and Chinner together. And then there was Robbie Irons mm -hmm. and Norm Wyslowski. Yeah. And, uh, it was just cool because you could see they gravitated to each other of who they played with. And then at the end of it, before they all left, you could see them all kind of mix in together. And it well, was, it and, was really and, neat to see. And that's, and, I, and I'm going to brag a little bit about this one thing. There's two things off the top of my head that I'm really, really proud of that I had influence on the Comets. One is 57 and 58 <clears throat> hanging there for Elliot and Lister. Yep because I came up with 57 and 58, which was the year they came. Because, you know, what number do you put up there for them? Yeah. And I'm so thrilled that they did that before those guys passed and they got to enjoy it. The other thing is, and they'll probably admit this, I was on there, but for 15 years, we got to reopen the Hall of Fame. Yeah. We have to reopen the Hall of Fame. Um, and Bob had started it, I believe in 82. And it hadn't restarted for like, 16, 17 years. And I kept on. And I even wrote stories about it. We've got to start the Hall of Fame. You've got to honor these guys before they pass because not everybody deserves to have a banner. Yeah. But they deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. And it needed to be the off ice officials too. It needed to be Ruth Wiegman. It needed to be Z the Zimmermans. It needed to be Wynn Rude and Ken Rares and, and those people. It really did because they've been here for freaking ever and they don't get paid. You know, I mean, they are as much a part of Comet Hockey as some of the players and some of the coaches and, and stuff. And so I'm really, really proud of those two <clears throat> things um, having an influence on that. But we had a show at Ruth's house. <laughs> that must have been 10 hours. No, well, it was Ben and it was Ben. Did she cook for you? There was a ton it, of it was there. Yeah, uh, yeah it I don't know. It, yeah. it was the preseason it was, party. Pre party. How cool is Ruth's story? And the her comment room. Yeah, that yeah. is great. Which I've moved three times. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's a lot of stuff to move. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And she uh, she, was she awesome. walks on the sim pretty good. Yeah. She was like, anything you need? And then, yeah. I mean, that was a long show, too. Speaking yeah. of the Comets Hall of Fame, <laughs> we actually, in that house. Yeah. We, we, put her on the, we put her on the show, too. Yeah, yeah. it was in her Lazy Boy, right? Uh, that, I she was she, in a rocker. Yeah, she that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, she had to have her tea. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can't tell you. I can't tell you how many times I've eaten Bruce. I mean, she she told Ben and uh, Ben and Olivier that she expected a championship. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised at all. <laughs> she said she needed that one other ring. She needed one more ring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have, did she show you her jersey with all the, the, the all the guys' names on it that live yep. there? Oh yeah. She told us a lot of stuff like who, how many kids she's had live with. Oh, it's her. insane. It was it was awesome. I've seen her Christmas cards. They're unbelievable. That's how I did in. Um, <laughs> That's how I started uh, Legends of the Comets. I did a Where Are They Now in the back of it, which is like almost two a thousand players. I did it through Ruth's Christmas lit card. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It's That's unbelievable. Awesome. <laughs> and I found like I, I found like, there was only like four guys who had played here ten games or more that I couldn't find. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> and uh, a couple of them didn't want to be found because the law was after them. <laughs> and, I, and that's not a joke either. Wow. Um, and but I started with Ruth's Christmas card list, that's awesome. and it was so awesome because uh, ninety percent of the time I could find a teammate and say, "Yeah, this guy's over here," or "This guy's here." I just heard from him five years ago. You know, I mean, and things like that. 
Actually, she gave us all these pins too. No, oh, I don't. Oh yeah, and, and she would not let us leave. Yes, yeah, you, you you had to take a pin. Yeah. Well, had to it take says, a pin. God bless, God bless you and Ruth Wigman on it. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, there's so many great stories like that. It is. It's that's the best part about this place. I mean, it's just, God, man, I hate if we ever lost all that. Yeah. It would just mean so much less. I mean, I, I just, you know, for my whole career, I tried to encapsulate what the comets meant to Fort Wayne. And then onto the show was my attempt to encapsulate what the comets meant to the hockey world. Right. Yeah. And, and that was why this book got started. That and Linda Anderson, who's a, a fan from Philadelphia. And um, she is a lawyer and uh, an elder law attorney who's amazing. And she was working herself to death. And she, uh, she had become a fan of Bobby Orr when she was growing up in Boston. And Al Sims was Bobby's defensive partner. And so yeah. she became a fan of Al Sims. So she decided she was going to take some time off from work and really take care of herself and uh, do some things for herself. So she started using the internet to look up different things. And she looked up Al Sims and found my blog. And so she started asking me questions and stuff. And then she came out to visit. And now she comes out twice a year to visit. And she's always bringing people with her. And she's the most generous person alive. Um, she's always, uh, she buys a Girl Scout uh, house at the Gingerbread Festival, the Festival of Trees every yep. year. She pays four times what it's worth, but it's worth it to her. And she supports the Girl Scouts that way and stuff. And um, and so I dedicated uh, the book to her. And uh, and it just really, there's so many fantastic stories like that that are out there. And there's always new stories all the time. You know, Sid scoring the goal for 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 Jonathan Chepler as he's as he's yeah. essentially dying. Yeah, that made me tear up when that happened. I mean. <laughs> After the he scored, went and to the hospital. I was so mad because I should have. I was the only one who knew about it, you know, because I'm friends with Mark and, and and everybody there, and you know, I knew. I went up to the hospital after that game. Yeah. And I had talked to Sid, and, and of course, all the TV guys are following me, and they, hey, what's this story, Sid? And I'm, I'm interviewing him. I'm like, yeah, shoot, I should have waited until I take him out on the bench or something, but it's okay. Jonathan's story deserves to be told. Did. And then I went up and, and um, talked to his folks after the game. I mean, just – and Sid had been there that day and said he was going to score a goal for John, you know. I mean, and he did. And it just – you know, Sid stuffs up so many ways behind the scenes that nobody knows about. And they don't need to know about him. But I hope people realize and understand how special Sid is. I mean, Sid is doing something that should never happen again. He's staying in Fort Wayne. Now, Peyton has a lot to do with that, and he's a smart man. <laughs> but his family has adopted Fort Wayne, too. Yeah. You know, but, I mean, Sid is as genuine as you ever want to believe. I mean, he just is that guy, and he's exactly who his parents raised him to be. It know? was uh, moving to the Tip of Comet thing the other night, and uh, it was the first time my wife had ever met uh, Sean. Mm -hmm. And he came in after the other guys did, because he knew and him and AJ came in last, mm -hmm. and AJ went around, and then Sean went to every single person in the room. I'm not surprised at all. He was the last, first, last one in, the last one out. He stopped at every table, talked to every person, and one time he had to go to the bathroom, and somebody's like, Sean, wait, and he goes, I'll be right back. I got to pee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and he uh, did, didn't he? Yeah, he came straight back right to her. Hopefully he washed his hands. <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> we don't comment on hygiene and practices. <laughs> but I mean, but that's Sean. I mean, and that is not an act. That's the coolest thing about the comments is, is they're genuinely that nice. They if look, not, they're not here. You got to be good. Legs is watching. Oh, cool. Hi, Legs. How are you, bud? <laughs> How's Rachel and the kids? Um, and if it, it always kills me. They go on a long road trip like uh, first 10, 15 games in the season. Yeah. Watch how many trades they make after that. Mm -hmm. Because by then they know this guy is not a common. Yeah. Every year that's what happens. And they know by then they know, oh, that you're out of here. Sorry. No, they ain't working. Sorry. We need to move him. Mm -hmm. And they move him because they're either, they don't fit. They get a great offer or they're just not very good people. 
-hmm. And they don't they don't mess around on that. They get rid of them, period. And that's been that way with the Frankies forever. I mean, they do not mess around. If you embarrass the team or the franchise or them, you're your good. ass is gone. And it, it we don't we don't play you ever again. I mean, and uh and you and you would be shocked how many times I have heard from guys over the years. Yeah, I was such an idiot. I screwed that up so freaking bad. You know, and I didn't realize what I had there. Yeah. I remember Terry Marchant coming in and absolutely being flabbergasted because of the way things were run here compared to everywhere else he had played in his career. And he got, I got new skates. It's the middle of the season. I get new skates. What do you mean my sticks are already here? I just got here. Well, they were on order. How did you do that? Joe Franke takes such amazing care of those guys. Joey's the next name that needs to go up in the banners. Yeah. Want to know Joe needs to be up there someday. Yeah, he's getting movie about that guy. Who's who has worked for the comics longer than he has? And nobody right now. But he sets the tone in a lot of good ways, too. He can be a dass hole. I mean, he, he's Joe. Yeah. I mean, he's so happy with his marriage, too. That helps a lot. That's really mellowed him a lot. I'm so happy for him. Um, but Joey needs to be up in the rafters. Um would you agree with us the next player to be up there? No. You don't think Sid? Not yet, no. Well, down the road. No. Hmm. And I don't know yet. I mean, and I'm not saying no, absolutely not. Not yet. Yeah. Um, I think if, if, you, had to, if you had to add one right now today. Uh, not to put you on the spot or anything. No, but the, the thing of it is, the thing of it is, guys, and people don't understand this. You don't just look at that player. You look at 67 years. Right. If you put him up, who's that open it up to? Yeah. Because yeah. uh, yeah, there's right. always five or six other guys that you open it up to. That now, close. do they deserve to be there? Correct. Uh, I don't know. Well, I, I am so I, thankful that's not my call. I guess my question would be: It's easy to say there, who goes up there. Is there oh, anybody? It's not easy to say who doesn't go. Up there. Is yes. there anybody that's not up there that you believe, player-wise, that should be up there that isn't? That you think, gun to my head, had to do it. This is who I'd put in there, or do you think it's it's right right now? I think Joe needs to be up there. I really do. I've said that for years. Right. I've told the Frankies that. I've told Scott Sproke that. Uh, I mean, if you look at overall impact to the franchise, correct? Yeah. Yep. It's no question. Um, I don't know. I you know I mean he's he's active. I don't have to think about it yet. Sure. So I don't. I mean he's gonna be he's definitely gonna be considered. No doubt. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And all the things he's meant to the team. I mean he is the face of the franchise. Oh yeah. And has been for five years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, without a doubt. I mean you think about it. When Sid came here, he was buried here. Yeah. He was like Buffalo gave up on him. And and. They were burying him here. They didn't want to see him anymore, basically. And, he, and look at how he turned his whole career around. Yep. Um, you know, and I know he and Gary don't get along sometimes. He owes a lot to Gary. Gary pushed him like nobody's business to get into shape and stuff. Now, I'm not saying it's a perfect relationship in any stretch, but they both needed each other. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, he stepped up. When he was on the show, he said that. Yeah. He basically said the exact. You know, he, I'm paraphrasing, but he pretty much said, you know, last year my head was up my ass, blah, 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 blah. Right. But, you know, and you could just tell. I mean, there was a respect there. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, they weren't they weren't buddies. They no. Weren't, you know, they no. weren't. And you out, shouldn't be your buddy with your boys. You know, but. How but, many guys, it's funny because I always hear these guys, well, they hate the coach. Yeah, and you love your boss, right? You know, how many people actually love their boss? I'm well, that, but that's, but so. that's different. But that's yeah. but they always say they always say that's different. No, it's not. These guys are not making half a million a Correct. year. Correct. You know, it's the same thing. You know, nobody lo should never love their boss because their boss is always trying to get more out of them than they're willing to give. Yep. Especially in sports. Yeah, but I love my wife. So. Well, that, that's and she's boss. definitely exactly. exactly. Yeah, she's <laughs> definitely trying to get more out of you yeah. than you're willing to give. <laughs> I'm a. Uh, I'm about four people behind here. Okay, go ahead. How long will the Frankies hold on to the comments? Till they get the offer they want. I think that's, I mean, 
like we said, that's amazing. They they've gone this far, uh, and they they really I mean this really is a labor of love. The stuff that they've been through, um, yeah. I mean, until they get the offer they want, probably. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. But and then uh, let's see, Karen Thompson says. Blake talking about my special players. See you at Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay, see you, Karen. That's Bob's daughter. <laughs> oh, okay. And then uh, Frank said Joe was unreal. He's helped us a ton. Oh, he helps everybody. Yeah. Now, he may gripe and grumble and groan and be grouchy and grumpy about it, but he'll do it. If he says he's done, he's going to take care of it. It's done. Yeah. It may not be on your time frame. It might be on his, but it's done. Yeah. I mean, Joe's amazing. Joe knows so much history, too. Yeah. He'd be one we he, it would be a blast, but you'd be bleeping, 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 bleeping. We, we, we don't <laughs> bleep. <laughs> it might be the most popular I, show ever. I, I, I've been really good at my bleeps. <laughs> Here you go. A, AJ's the one that, if yeah. we had the bleep, it would have been AJ's. Yeah. Right? So far. Yeah. Um, that was awesome. Yeah. So where were, oh, well, should Sean be, Sean will answer that. Well, I don't, I don't know. I'm saying that, I mean, Sean will provide the answer to that. I, I'm not even saying Sean. I'm saying anybody that isn't up there that not not Sean. I'm I'm saying anybody that isn't up there. Let's tell you how far out of this like I think, folks. I gotta look it up. <laughs> um and you know who's underrepresented up there are defensemen. Agreed. Um as a goalie I have to give See up. and I I've yeah. always thought Kerry Lusick should be up there. See me too. That's Didn't score a ton of points, but he was the best defenseman, the best defensive defenseman in the greatest era of the IHL as far as physical skill ever. Yep. And he was the best at what he did. If you had a two-on-one against the Comets, if Lucy was there, if Louie was there, you just, okay, it's over. And they never got it. No. He was great that way. And I've always felt like defense, defensemen were underrepresented. Because it's not flashy. No, it's, it's not, not flashy. You know, and that's, you know, that's that's one thing. Uh, you know, look at this. Jimmy Burton. How can, you know, if uh, Dale Baldwin. Um, yeah, that's one that I don't understand how we in there. And then you got Jumbo Goodwin. Um, Dubber. I don't know. I know Goodwin. Uh, he was on the lines with the greatest line ever, you know, yeah. with Primo and, and – uh, and those guys, and, and uh, you know, he centered Lonnie or Lenny a lot and stuff. I mean, Man, you know, Cal Prairington. Yeah. You know, I mean, the thing of it is, if you put one more guy up, it opens it up for seven others. Sure. And you got to consider that. Yeah. Because that is a very personal topic to those guys, too. It's a very personal. In all honesty, we're running out of numbers. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's all right. Just put, I always said they should just put the names up. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been three 12s. You know, there's Lusick, uh, there's um, uh, Leifer, and there's Primo. And, and Leifer, Leifer's another one. Yeah. I mean, if Leifer had played after 1990, he'd be up there. Yeah. But he played in the 80s when nobody went to the games. Same with Baldy. Yeah. You know, uh, same with, with Jimmy Burton. You know, you got to think about that stuff. You can't just say so-and-so should be up there. You can't do it. It's not fair. It's it needs to be a well thought out reasoned process. It can't be a fan's heart making that decision. Sure. It just can't. It's too important. It has too many ramifications. Yep, that, I agree. That need to be included. You know, um, yeah. There's too many things that go in that need to go into it. So, check the basement score. People are asking. Who? Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, you know, want to talk about some more books? Sure. Yeah. All right. After uh, I did Lloyd's, Lloyd Ball's book, um, which is called The Biggest Mistake I Never Made, because there are so many people, even after he won the gold medal, said, yeah, you made a mistake not playing for Bobby. And it's like, the guy is the only man in U.S. history to ever play for four teams in the Olympics. I mean, think about that. He would never have done that playing basketball. Agreed. He won a gold medal in – a team sport, you know, I mean, it's just uh, the best player in the world. And there's still people who say you should have played for Bobby made a mistake. It's like, you guys have no concept of reality, you know? 
uh, the things that Loy has accomplished in the pro leagues in Europe, he's the Michael Jordan over there. When he comes out of his apartment in Japan, it's Loison, Loison, Loison. I mean, it's like he's a rock star, mm -hmm. you know. That never would have happened if he had just played basketball for Bobby. I mean, he had been coming off the bench, you know, I mean, he'd have burned him out too. Um, mm -hmm. So after that, I wrote my first novel, which is called The Lake Effect. Um, it's my shot at a great American novel. Um, and this is kind of the, the premise. And you guys tell me how nuts I am. Okay, at least about this. Know. At least about this. <laughs> yeah. Sometime between the ages of 22 and 32, there's a time in your life where something happens to you. Uh, maybe it's the birth of a child, maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's getting divorced, maybe it's quitting a job or getting fired. Maybe it's for my dad, it was when he went to boot camp, for my mom, it's when she broke off an engagement. Um, uh, for me, it was when I quit a job, when I didn't have anything else lined up. And after that event, you are an adult. That is a defining rite of passage. And everybody, only you can define what it was for you. Maybe you moved away from home. Uh, everybody I tell that definition to knows what their event was. Hmm. And they don't even think about it. And it, okay, so, and I've never met anybody yet who couldn't tell me what their event was. So that I thought was a great idea for a novel because why, if everybody goes through it, why didn't our parents tell us about it? <laughs> right? So I, I did a book of 15 friends and what their events were. And they're sitting around the dorm one night. They got snowed in, so it's the lake effect. And they're all shooting the bull. And one of the guys comes up with this theory that he heard from his uncle. And the rest of them being 22 and stupid, as we all were at 22. Yep. Uh, some of us, it lasts a little longer. <laughs> and uh, so he decides he's going to remember that. And 15 years later, he's going to track down everybody was there and see if they had their event. And so it's what their events were and stuff. And there was a great, and I totally give this to God because there's a way it starts in the beginning and it ends in the, in the ending, it all ties together. And, and so that was that. Was that. It, it's, some of them are funny, some of them are serious, some of it's a death of a parent. Um, these are real life experiences things. These are real things that happen to real people, but I novelized it. Um, and, uh, and it's amazing how many people read it and say, oh, crap, I never thought of it that way before, yeah. you know, and that kind of thing. So the next novel was called Homecoming Game. And this was, you remember when Michigan got beat by Appalachian State? Yeah, I don't talk about that. Day. Or yes. when they almost got beat by, was it Army this year? Who was it this year? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, it has, I know, it has nothing to do with that. Salt wound. But it was like, <laughs> what if there was a uh, an all-time upset? And so it's called Homecoming Game because it's about these two kids from a small town in Indiana who are lifelong uh, Indiana Western fans, which was Purdue, essentially. Ohio Valley is Ohio State. Um, Lilly College is IU. Mm -hmm. Except you know it's fiction because Lilly College is really good at football. <laughs> and so they... Hey, they're going bowling. They, they are. <laughs> and I covered them for a long time. I mean, during the Mallory era. Mallory era. Um, cool. Yeah, which was which was fun because Trent Green was great and uh, Vaughn Dunbar and Cal Miller. I mean, those guys were so much fun to work with. Great people, and 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 Trent Green married miles over his head too. He married a girl from Fort Wayne who plays tennis, who played tennis at Homestead, and, and I always tease him about that. Um, and uh, and he lives in Fort Wayne now. Yeah, and and now he flies out every weekend to do NFL games. Anyway. Um, so these two kids walk on at Indiana Western and the offense, the defensive coordinator hates them because he doesn't like walk-ons. He just thinks you're wasting spots and it's a really bad year. It's kind of, um, labeled after Purdue on Purdue after Drew Brees left and everything yeah. that happened there. Yeah. And so a bunch of kids get suspended. A bunch of kids get hurt. There's food poisoning. These guys actually end up playing the arch rival game against Lilly College after they've announced that the head coach is being fired. And they lead this miraculous comeback. And Lilly College is the defending big Midwest champions. Okay, so they lead this miraculous comeback. 
And then after the season, the defensive coordinator becomes the head coach who hates them. So they got nowhere to play. So the the offensive coordinator, whose name is Denny Shebig in the story. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he goes out to this small school in California in Camarillo, which is his alma mater, and starts a football program. He convinces these guys and a bunch of other guys who got kicked off the team to come with him. And they were all freshmen and sophomores. So they build a powerhouse in Division II. So going into their senior year, Indiana Western has to move their uh, uh, move their opening their their game against Ohio Valley, which is Ohio State, to the season opening ESPN kickoff game. And the reason this reminded me is because Purdue did it against West Virginia about ten years ago. They had to move that game. Well. <coughs> In this story, that was Indiana Western's homecoming date. You can't move a homecoming date. No. The tickets are bought, the hotel rooms are booked, the flights are all booked, everything. You can't do it. So suddenly they need a game. And so they decide, what if we call these guys? That would sell itself. These were the heroes of the comeback, and it's the former coach and blah, 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 blah. And so the story kind of starts from there with – Indiana Western calling Camarillo and say, hey, we're in a bind. We'll pay you whatever you need. Come out here to play. And these guys are good now, though. I mean, they're really good on the Division II level. They're one of the top-ranked teams in Division II. And so it starts out with the, the coach, the former offensive coordinator, having to convince these two guys, let's do this. And it's in the summer when they tell them. So it's about all these California kids – coming back to the Midwest to play this game and they go on a hayride and they go to the street fair and they go to uh, all this kind of stuff. And they all show up wearing shorts and t-shirts because they're California kids in, in, in late October. You know what I mean? Hmm. But it's all that kind of, they take them on a snipe hunt. I mean, they do all these kind of things. They do all this Midwest stuff and then they play the game. And and that's all I'm going to say. Like, yeah, <laughs> don't, don't give it yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was it was kind of based off of the Michigan Appalachian State game a little bit. Yeah. That gave me the idea that okay, this really could happen. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun to do it because I, I write the book all in active tense, and the reason I did it that way, I like to challenge myself when I'm writing books to try new writing styles and things. But I did it that way so that when they played the game, you could still be active. You could put the fan in the middle of the game so they could sense the time going down on the clock. Oh, crap, they're running out of time. You know, I mean, this type of thing. Right. And you could put them in the middle of the game. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm really proud of that book because I really stuck it out there. And, <laughs> you know, and it was fun. It was fun. I knew I was okay when one of my best friends, Rick Tomlinson, said he was reading it in bed at night and he was laughing so hard he woke his wife up. <laughs> and then he read it to her, and she started laughing, too. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah that was fun. <clears throat> Blake says he misses you around the rink. I hope everything's going good. It's going great, Blake. Thank you very much. I miss you guys, too. All right. Um, let's see. What else? We got Oh, the two latest ones, oh. if you don't mind. Uh, first off, I, did, uh, I helped Betty Stein write her book. Betty died at 102 recently. She was one of my mentors, a great lady. And... Uh, just a fantastic lady. She wrote for the New Center for 27 years, and so we put together a book of her best columns. And uh, it's amazing how relevant they are today. Nobody, I used, I was trying to market it as the best or the oldest first-time author in America. She wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> she was 102, and uh, like she wrote comparing 9/11 to Pearl Harbor Day. Wow. Nobody else could do that, but she could do it and explain it so it meant something to today's people. Sure. It's riveting. I mean, all that kind of stuff. Uh, she wrote about what Fort Wayne was like in the 1940s, what it was like for Christmas on Calhoun Street and stuff and, and different things. I mean, just an amazing perspective on things and funny, too. Funny. And then, um, okay, so these are the two latest ones. The first one's called Lethal Ghost. And I try, I wanted to write a mystery, and I wanted to write something that no one would ever expect me to write. <laughs> And so I had to have a villain. What, what makes a great James Bond movie? It's not James Bond. It's the villain. Well, there you go. <laughs> but 
but what if they're the villain? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you never know. Even better. Yeah. yeah. So I try to come up with a, a, a villain that was memorable. So, okay, it's got to be a serial killer. Yep. How does the FBI or the police catch a serial killer? Well, they have patterns. They kill in the same area. They use the same weapon. They kill the same type of people. They do it on a timetable. Mm -hmm. What if there was a serial killer who didn't do any of that? How would you catch this person? How would you even know this person was out there? The person kills the wrong victim, and she happens to be related to a police officer. And he won't give it up. He won't let go until he finds whoever this is. All right. Something happens at the end of this book. I'm not going to tell you, but you can get a pretty good idea, which leads to the second one called Lethal Justice. And it, there's a big trial. And it deals, and I really can't say anything more unless you've read the first book. <laughs> right. Um, but there's a surprise ending at the end of the first book. There's a surprise ending at the end of this book. And I'm working on the third book right now. That's called Lethal Family. Susan and Bill said, who inspired the murders? Uh, my mother. My mother. <laughs> uh, because I would get stuck and I would need an unbelievable murder you could get away with. Like, I give this to the guys at the house sometimes, and which are, you know, they're addicts. They're guys, some of them live on the streets and stuff. And I say, read that book and then see if you want to mess with me anymore. <laughs> 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 and we just laugh about it, you know. I mean, but, uh, but my mother, every time I get stuck and I would, I need another murder. Because I told the first one in alternating chapters. It's the bad guy, the good guy, the bad guy, the good, all the way through. And there's a couple chapters where they overlap, yeah. which are fun, you know. And so uh, uh, so I, would, I need an extra chapter. I got to come up with another bad guy chapter. And mom would say, well, what about killing them this way? <laughs> so my mom came up with the best ways to kill people and get away with it. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of terrifying. It is yeah. kind of terrifying, isn't it? Yeah. You should be your son. Don't make I mom mad. I never talk back, ever. <laughs> so, but I, and like I said, I've got five or six other ones in my head. I just got to get the time to do them. So I'll have a good retirement. I'll have fun. Oh, there you go. So but these are all on Amazon. Um, and uh, like I said, the Bob book is going to be Bob uh, bobchasebook.com for an audio book. Yeah, we shared the link in there. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right, my question that I ask everybody, uh, Powers or Coney Island? Oh, Powers. Yeah, and I love Coney Island. I love Coney Island. Oh, too. I do too. And the, but yeah. It's remember. amazing how many people in Fort Wayne don't know about Powers. I know. Right? I know. It's like, what is wrong with you people? I, I agree completely. Now, that you have to do it in a specific way. You can't take them home in your car because your car will suck for the next week or two. <laughs> Unless you're trying to hide a smell, you don't dare. No, do no, 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 no. I, what are you talking about there? Oh, no, why, why? What, I'm anything a, a, specific? Yes, Where are you hiding it from? from? So, so I mean, oh, I thought you were hiding something else you no, might have no. been smoking from the police officers. No, my, uh, <laughs> I'm a cashier guy, and uh, I go home, uh, I, I come home from the cigar shop, my wife hates the smell. Gotcha. So uh, there's a cigar shop called Rudy's downtown, Yeah. and I would just, it's a block from power, so I just stop in, buy six sliders, and yeah. go home. Never knew I smoked a cigar. Oh, I know. It's like, then she, why would they, about that. and why do they ever put cheese on? Why, who was sacrilegious enough to put cheese on powers, you know? I've always had them with cheese, though. I, mean, oh, I, I don't know if I've heathen. ever had them without. You heathen. I'm not going to try it that way. I mean, they're not in your mouth long enough to taste the cheese, you know? Well, yeah. And you got to let them cool off first, because those things are hot. Yeah. Uh, especially they wrap them and hold the heat in. Uh -huh. You can burn your tongue real easy. That's a great question, though. We ask every player. <laughs> And you wouldn't believe the guys that just got here, they're like, oh, Coney Island. Yeah, the guys they have no clue. Here. They no clue. But they, but they, and I love they, Coney Island. I mean, and no, and you know, uh, one of the Choka boys was David Trumpy's best friend. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of ties between Coney Island and the Comets. Uh, you, you call Michael Franke's out eating lunch, he's more than likely there. Yeah, I've seen him many times stop in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ties there. Um, we, uh, who was Sid said Coney or uh, Powers because the real Coney Island was in Detroit. Yeah, well, why wouldn't they? And then, uh, <laughs> Come on, Peyton, fix that guy. Patrick's <laughs> Elliot. Uh, we looked at he's like Coney Island or Powers, and he was like, "What?" Yeah, <laughs> I had no idea. I was like, "How long have you been here?" Oh yeah. man, like we need to we need to teach you. Team what? outing, team outing. Come on, exactly. There's you some know. team building stuff for you, Lee. I mean, except they couldn't all fit in there. 
you know, you'd have to do it in shifts. Oh, in powers? Yeah. yeah and, and you don't want to do it. Do, and you don't want to do it before a tin cast game either. You know, yeah. I mean, you got to be what you could just get your own section afterwards. And you, you can't do it, you know, Wednesday before Thanksgiving. You know, one of them. You know, I mean. <laughs> yeah, there's limits. Yeah, you got to be smart about it. You know. Uh, yeah. I don't think I've ever walked out of there with less than two dozen because I always take some home. Oh, I know. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, uh, Bob Zimmerman when he was passing at the at the St. Joe, we had a, where's that park? We had either or uh, probably St. Joe. We, we had we had a dozen Coney Islands that night, and that's the most active he was for like a day or two <laughs> before that, and then he he passed the next night, I think. I mean, oh, that's not. We were we were handing them out all over the place, all the nurses and everything. That's like. You know, it's kind of weird how many deathbeds I've been at for the comets. You know, I mean, just kind of you know, strange. But, you know, these people are family. You know, I mean, they yeah. really are. I mean, uh, I don't know how else to explain it. I mean, well, the one thing I've noticed just sitting here talking to you, listening to you talk, it doesn't matter if it's the book or the comments or volleyball or John or any of them. you're passionate. Yeah. About about what you do. Yeah, I mean, and and that's what it was so funny because. So many fans assumed I was a fan. I thought so too. Yeah, I, it's like, no, if they need their ass kicked, I'll kick it. You know, <laughs> I mean, but maybe sometimes I know what's going on behind the scenes, and I also understand these guys are not making five hundred grand a year; they're making twenty to twenty-five, and some of that crap is their business. You know, it's nobody else's business. It's amazing yep. solve and play. You know, or if there's something that goes on in the locker room. It needs to stay in the locker room. Yeah. And it needs a chance to fix itself. It needs a chance to heal or whatever. Uh, you know, there were a lot of times I knew stuff that was going on. It's nobody else's business. You know, I, if some guy's going through problems with his wife, that's none of your damn business, you know? Right. Um, or if their kids are sick or something, you know, um, you know, Chalker was so great at that. So was Jamie. Jamie was just. Jamie yeah. doesn't get the credit for being a captain that he deserves. Right. Um, Jamie was, and Chinner, Chinner and, and Shrocky, they never got the credit for being captain that they deserved because they were very much, all four of them, and so was Boise and Gee, um, they're very much level guys. Don't get too high, don't get too low. There was a time where I was talking to a goalie who'd had back to back shutouts. And he was talking about how good he was doing and he was a really young kid and Chinner says, guys, excuse me for a minute. He pulled the guy over to the side and just talked to him. Didn't get, didn't raise his voice. The guy comes back and goes, man, I got to tell you how good my defense is playing. <laughs> Stuff like that, yeah. that you never, you just kind of take for granted, mm -hmm. but it is so important. It was all about we instead of me all of a sudden, you know, and I, I must have seen Chinner do that 15 times over the years. You know, that was what was so cool about when they brought in Scotty. Because Al told me, every team you can afford to have one asshole. <laughs> there it was. And, and it was, but I mean, but he said, and this was so true, and it's still today, it's still true today with the comments. You can afford one jackass only if your captain is secure and everybody's backing the captain. Now, I saw Scotty do some things that any other team would have been a huge problem. Like Scotty and Colin would go out drinking, and the next day Scotty would be like in the in the locker room instead of practicing. And Chinner would be out there working his tail off, and it was that was his gift. He could go out partying and show up in two hours sleep and not work every day. Yeah. And he'd go over to Scotty. Is Scotty feeling a little tired today? And get, I mean, he would just get into him. And Scotty would get so mad he'd go out and do it, you know. I mean, that was the glory of Colin. He could – nobody could outlast him. Yeah. And he could go out and do that stuff still. But Al knew with Fletchy and Louie were his alternates. And you had uh, – who else did you have on that team? You had – well, Bobby was a rookie. Um, you know, you had Lambo, You had guys, Lax. You had all those guys. Boise was there. That there was no way – Scotty was going to be able to get the chin or to take over. Right. He had to go through six layers to get there. And that's something I've always remembered because, you know, you talk about the comments bringing in a guy like AJ or uh, other guys over the years that they brought in 
who? Why the hell are they bringing that guy? It's that reason. Because he fits. He fits, and there's no way he can take over. You were never going to outlast Shrocky in the room because yeah. Shrocky has so much respect from everybody. You were never going to disrupt him. Yeah. You know, you were never – Sean was never going to let that happen. You know, uh, neither was Bobby, Shay, or any of those guys. I mean, Bobby and Sean didn't have to have a letter to be a leader. There's, that's the key to the comments. Cody didn't have to have a letter to be a captain. There's so many guys that they do a great job of who don't have to have letters to be leaders, to be an authority figure. Um, you know, Jamie, take the letter away. He don't care. It isn't going to make a Hills Beans worth a difference to him. Yeah. But I respect Jamie for so much because every time they lost, Jamie was standing at his locker waiting for the meeting. Yeah. And you immediately just subconsciously went to him and he was honest. He was forthright. And all those guys were her captain. Shrocky was the best at that, too. They all stood up for the team. Yep. And people take that for granted. Like, how in the hell is that guy captain? There's a reason, folks. You may not see it. Those You don't need to see it. Those guys see it. Mm-hmm. You know, like this time right now, who's going to be captain? Those guys know who the leaders are. You don't have to have a letter. You know, Binks is a leader. Yeah. You know. Oh, now you got the other guy. Yeah. You got oh, mom. Denise is watching. Cool. <laughs> yeah, is baby girl watching? That's what I want to know. Uh, yeah. One of the coolest pictures I ever got was Sean flipping his the puck in the air on a stick and warm-ups right in front of his niece who's up against the glass watching. Oh, wow. That was so cool. <laughs> I sent that to him. Um, it's funny you said that every team has an asshole on it. They do. And they need because one. We had Sid. Sid was on, and AJ called in because we wanted to clear the air. Yeah. And uh, Sean's like, "Yep. Well, everybody get used to it because he's our asshole now." Right. <laughs> you need one. You and know. AJ I mean. Agreed. And sometimes that asshole fills a role in that he will stir things up when it needs stirred up. Now the best assholes, Scotty included, would do it in conjunction with the captain. Okay. Like I would see him and Chinner go at it sometimes. But then they'd hug it out. It's like they're brothers, you know. Yeah. I mean, I seen that. Ted, Craig Duncanson was when he was captain. He got it that way, and that team had way too many assholes. And he was there's nothing he could do. Um, you know, the, everybody talks about the comments they never have a fighting team. Oh, 95, 96 was the worst team they ever had. They had Mac, another great leader, Kevin McDonald. They had Fletchy. They had Bawa. They had Bezo. They had Sean Gagnon. Oh, and, wow. And That's somebody right. else. And that was a great fighting team that couldn't play worth a lick. Because that's all. And, and there were some guys on a team never should have been brought back. And I'm not saying any of those guys. Well, one of them. But it's not who you think. Um, they were more worried about themselves than they were about the team. Yep. And it was a huge problem. And Ian, I think, was captain. And Guy was there. You know, I mean, it was awful. It was awful. And, uh, you know, there has to be a balance of toughness. So, come on, more questions. Yeah, they're, they're slowing down a little. We're wearing them out. I really haven't been that many. <laughs> yeah, not a whole lot. Um, actually, we'll probably wind down here shortly. Um, man, I had a good question. I can't remember what that was. I know, I've had that problem all day. <laughs> I haven't. I've been fucking stellar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you guys do okay. have fun with this. That's great. <laughs> oh yeah. We I mean, th- th- this is kind of this is kind of like the essence of the comments and what they mean to Fort Wayne too. It's fans who are part of it. This is yeah. more not professional. This is right. You know, it kind of goes back to Randy and Tim doing the broadcast. Yeah, yeah, I love yeah. it. When the, and 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 mullet. Did you, did you yeah, yeah, exactly. Interview with yeah. Larry. <laughs> yeah, oh well, yeah. I think I was there for that. You know, I never had the option of having a mullet. I know you're surprised. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, and guys like Larry and, and Shane and, and I tell you, I love listening to Shane. I did, yeah. He is not Bob and that is the best parts of it. Uh, because Shane is his own guy and he had to find his way and he's found it. And he nailed it. You know, I just love listening to Shane because he's giving you the same effort, whether the team sucks or they're great. Yep. And he's grown so much. Uh, and it's like, I don't know. I know how they're playing when I'm listening to him. I can tell. I've listened to him enough. Yeah. You know, 
Um, and I just, I just think he does a spectacular job. We were, uh, we went up to Kalamazoo a couple weeks ago. And now he owes me $5. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were playing uh, Wednesday night a couple weeks back up there. There was nobody there. There was never anybody in Kalamazoo. Well, unless the comments were. We filled it right. We filled right. it right. Saturday. I know. <laughs> um, but I texted. There was some call in the ice. What the hell was that? I looked up and I saw Shane just up there, you know. I was like, all right. We just started texting during the game. Yeah, because he's got time to do this, too. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm watching. And I texted him. I'm like, I told him my, my dad was with me. I was like, you watch within five minutes. Watch him. And it, they had a media timeout. Sure enough, you see him pull out his phone and he just. <laughs> and uh, he texts me back. He goes, "Your guess is as good as mine." Wow. But Shane, Shane keeps it real because he knows he is the fans' connection. Yeah, he really does. And he's seen enough, and he knows enough that it's important that to fulfill that role. And he just kind of slid in. I mean, it's amazing. Yep. Well, you didn't even. Yeah, there was no. There was, there was no transition. Oh, there was. Now. There totally oh. was. Okay, I'm sorry. As far as quality. No, you no, know. right, exactly. And I'm you not know. saying, I mean, I remember sitting down with Shane to do the story about his dad um, and um, how his dad came to America and couldn't speak English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how Shane's like, dad can do that. I can follow mom. I mean, that was an amazing story. Yeah. Uh, and he's exactly right. I mean, and, you know, you want to talk again about a guy who married 10 miles over his head. You know, I still can't figure that one out. <laughs> right, Kathy? You know. <laughs> but he sends his wife flowers before every playoffs because he knows they won't see her much. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, it's just like little things like that are so cool. Yep. Um, uh, it, Sean, uh, Sid's mom says, Blake, want to thank you for all the articles and coverages you did for Sean. Uh, you did good. I miss you right up. Oh, thank you. I miss you guys too. I miss, I you know I miss talking to the parents outside the locker rooms after games too. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. That that's part of it. That's where I get a lot of good story ideas too. I mean, just taking the time to be personal and you know just to talk to them. Right. And uh, you know one of the funnest stories I ever wrote was, uh, and it's also one of the most stressful. Because like we're just watching them, it's watching the parents. They all sit together in a section during the playoffs. Yeah. On the road games, that's hard. I mean, it is really hard. But I got to meet the Thomases, and you know, I got to meet the Thompsons. I mean, I met everybody. I think you know, one time or another. And but I mean, watching those people suffer through watching playoff games with their kids, knowing it could be the last games they ever see their kids play. Especially goalie parents. Oh, but, but I mean, any of them because. Yeah. The, Let's face it, if they're here, they're really not going anywhere. Yeah. You know, for the most part. And any game could be their last game, you know, and they know that. And you can't you can't hide from it. Yeah. And it, it's hard watching there and sitting with them and, and, and like letting them have their place to do that, you know. It, it's stressful. Very yeah. stressful for them. Even uh I could I do a lot of Indian tech stuff. Mm -hmm. And watching the kids and that, the parents for those kids is the same way. Well, think about it. You've been getting up at 4 a.m. on every Saturday for how long so your kid could do this? You've invested how much of your income every year mm -hmm. to be able to do this? A stick breaks. Oh, crap. There's another 100 bucks that's not in the budget. Yep. You know, there's all those kind of things. Not to mention the travel, the hotels, yeah. the restaurants, the hell, the injuries as you get growing up and stuff. I mean, the laundry with that stinky, sweaty, smelly, <laughs> you know, equipment and everything. Nick, you can go grab his pads if you want to. You know, yeah. your, your car. <laughs> yeah, you're hiding that door. Yeah, open it. the trunk of your car. You know, I mean, it's amazing the sacrifices that they make. And and how many kids don't make it? 98%. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's incredible. I was talking to a parent the other day um, for a local uh, U18 team. Uh, travel school or travel team, and they were saying it's ten plus. Oh yeah. Like, well, and, and, my and, 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 and think about it too. If if you have brothers and sisters, what do you do for them? You know, how do you keep them entertained and occupied, and how do you fulfill their dreams too? You know what you do? You go watch the Shastmas for a week. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because Nikki does. An oh, she's a, she's job. incredible. Uh, go watch Guy's wife Nicole. You know, I mean, she's something else too. 
uh, you know, Diane Chin. I mean, it was so much fun to meet all the wives. And, and like I said before, I mean, I would call the guys at night and talk to their wife for 20 minutes and them for five. Right. You know, and it was, it wasn't just shooting the bull. It was like how the kids doing, you know, I mean, I still miss the Shaftons. You know, I really do. I mean, they were so much fun. You didn't know that I named their last child, did you? Have you heard that story? So? Yeah. Really? Yeah. No. Yeah. Honest to God, I did. <laughs> um, not that it was after they did, but, you know, but I did. Because <laughs> they were, we were sitting around one day. I was doing a story about how, how, as a hockey wife, you prepare to travel when you get traded or when the season ends. Because it's it's a there's an art form to it. Is this the one where she was teaching people how to pack? And yes. Like, yeah, I remember yes. that story. And guys' wives or girlfriends would call her and ask her how to do it because she was the expert. At it. And uh, um, all the kids' names were at, started with S's. Yep. And all the middle names, I can't, oh man, I can't remember. Um, were B's, I think. I'm not sure on that one. Yeah, I think they're B's. I'm not sure. And so we were just shooting a bull and she was expecting Sloan. And I was like, uh, well, you're kind of out of, you're kind of out of, uh, out of range. You know what I mean? You're kind of out of options here because they got to match up. And I says, well, you could always go Sloan, Sloan Blaine or something. And Jamie looked at me mm-hmm. like I had, he goes, you got microphones in this place. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't find out until later that that was the actual name. And he goes, oh, wow. You freaked us out so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I've had coaches tell me that I had microphones in the offices before, uh, which I didn't. It's so funny because you work with people that close long enough, you understand how they think. Yeah. Correct. Like there have been five or six times over the years where I've known that a guy got released by somebody else, and I would call David Frankie and say, okay, you saw so-and-so got released. When are you bringing him in? And he'd get, he'd like, he'd start laughing. He'd go, He's on his way. He'll be here at midnight. <laughs> yeah. I'm picking him up at Fairfield. And <laughs> like Brent Henley. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was so funny. There was different, different times. You know, because I know how much they respect certain guys. Yeah. And they'd be like, <sighs> you can just hear him. It'd be so funny. Like, because, oh, crap. How do you do this? You know, I mean, it was so funny. But, but I just know how they think, you yeah. know, and how they, and it has to be somebody who I know they respect. Yeah. You know, it, it can't just be like I said, you know, I mean, it can't just be like Craig Sescon made perfect sense to me. It made absolute perfect sense to me. Oh, to bring it back last year? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even though I wasn't covering them anymore, I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. You know, I mean, it's just like, right. cause I know how they, and it is such, it's, it's everybody that's a retreat. No, it makes perfect sense because you know, the guy, you know his family. You know what kind of character he's got. You know if he's a work ethic guy. You know he's going to fit in the locker room. You know if he's going to be a jerk. Those are key things, bringing in somebody late in the year. And if you can find somebody like that, that you already know them, and they know you, and they know your culture, and they buy into it before they ever get here, right? that's worth its weight in gold. Mm-hmm. There are a million guys they've done that with. PC, oh, my gosh. You know, I mean, Colin, you know, Guy. There's so many guys who are fantastic players who they brought back because they never let them burn a bridge. Yeah. It was never personal. You know, it was always like, I can't tell you how many times I've seen the Franke brothers outside the visiting opponent's locker room, waiting for a guy to come out just to see how his family's doing. And it's totally legit and honest. It's not working a guy. It's not tampering. It's not, it's, it's real. Because they do help these guys and their families and stuff. They do take care of their families. You know, when they when when a guy's kid gets the flu and they tell him to stay home, or his wife gets the flu and they say, stay home and you take care of them, we don't need you tonight. Now, one, they don't want everybody getting the flu on the bus, but they honestly know that the guy's got three kids and if he's not there, who's taking care of them? Yeah. You know, stuff like that. They, I can't tell you how many times a guy's had to go home for a funeral. And they never, ever talk about when he's coming back. Yeah. It's never even mentioned. It's, it's, he'll be back when he's ready. Yep. He'll be back when he's not needed. You know, when Cody's cousin died, they never, ever said to him, we need you back by X date. And it's tore Cody to pieces because that was his best friend. 
And they never called him for that. They'd say, hey, how you doing? You know, is there anything we can do? You know, but it was never, when are you coming back? Right. Because they know the guy has to be right in his head to come back. Mm -hmm. And guys appreciate stuff like that. Um, there's so many things like that. Every one of the players that we've had that's been here for any kind of time have all said that, that it's a family. They feel like they could just go into the office anytime and sit oh. down and talk with anybody. No, they talk to, to Jody and Tammy all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk to Nancy. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's funny because you'd be shocked how many of those guys send Christmas cards back, mm -hmm. you know, later on in years and stuff. It, 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 they keep in touch. Pemmer would talk to somebody, oh, two, three times a week in Fort Wayne. He's in the middle of Texas working horses, and you'd get a phone call. You know, I mean, it happens. It happens all the time. It's like the comments become ingrained in these people. Well, hockey in general is a small, tight knit. Yeah. You know, I noticed that a lot. You know, you you go to a you talk to a player that just had a wedding. Yeah. I bet there's probably six different leagues. Oh, and, yeah. You know. Well, and I can't tell you how many times they'd make a trade, and I'd notice that the guy played hockey at so-and-so in college, and I'd call one of the guys, yeah, I just got off the phone with him. He can't wait to get here, blah, blah, blah. Here's his number. You know what I mean? It's like, and did, did the coach talk to you about this guy? Well, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, they check him out yeah. beforehand because they don't want any idiots. You know, I mean – he was best man in my wedding and, you know, I mean, all that kind of stuff. That's relevant. Right. And it happens all the time with that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible how tight knit all that is. And there are guys that I know they've had interest in over the years where one of the guys will say, he ain't going to fit here. He ain't going to work here. And they won't, they won't pursue it. Like, you know, you know, they talked to Sid before they ever brought AJ in. Yeah, oh, Sid, yeah. Sid told I mean, us. you know, they even weeks before they ever thought about giving him a contract offer, they were like, "What do you think of this?" Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. you know, they they've done all that. Yeah, know? that got brought up too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the coolest thing about what they're recruiting is not the names; it's the people they bring in. Yep. And I think that kind of got lost last year. Yeah. That <laughs> they brought in the guys with stats instead of the guys with people, and I think it really hurt them because. I could see it. I thought saw three games last year. I saw five individuals on the ice every damn time. Yep. yep. And I think you could see that right from the beginning. That's funny because we talked we talked to Gary. Yeah. When that was one of our sh first shows. Yeah. But we talked to Gary and we talked to him after you mm -hmm. know after the show and we were we kind of thought the same thing. We were like, you know, we uh, how come I noticed X never really passed to Y? And he goes. You notice that? Oh, you get everybody notices <laughs> I'm like, everything. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then when we had Y on the show, <laughs> we we confirmed that X. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing there haven't been more problems with, uh, let's say, relationships. That there haven't been more problems with relationships in the locker room. Um, but I think that's because of the people they bring in. Yeah. Because that can kill everything. As yeah. bad as the flu can kill everything, that can kill everything. You know, just talking to players this year, just talking to the people we've talked to, I wouldn't even have to watch them on the ice to know that that I think that they're yeah that they're pretty tight this this season. Yeah. Well, you know how you, you know? can tell too. Uh, at least I could always t I always had a sense of that, mm -hmm. and I could tell within the first fifteen minutes in the locker room, are they getting on each other are they teasing each other yep you know are they are they tagging each other you know yep. and how do they take it with Sid and Bobby in there oh my god that was funny with Cody oh my god I mean I, I was so many times I wish oh man I wish I could write about this but you couldn't <laughs> I mean, there's no way you could put it in the newspaper yeah, there you was, know there was a moment this year we had uh Petey on the show yeah and Sid was working on with a spaceman or something that day and he poked, poked his head in yeah. into the office and he was like, Hey, and they started ripping on each other. Yeah, oh, I know. He, I know. He's like, Hey, why don't you take your head off? Oh wait, the lights are, are off. The <laughs> lights will be too bright. So yeah. He's like, just... yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Cause, cause, uh, I mean, there were times when like I've seen Shafi, uh, put him into it, but he had a great sense of humor about it. Yeah. And it wouldn't be all right. Shut the F up. Yeah. It'd be like, 
you know, you guys really don't want me to get involved in this, do you? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, right. it could be all over real quick. And you go right up to Cody looking up at him. You know what I mean? <laughs> stuff like that. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. You, you just, you get a sense of it. That guy was a comedian, too. Oh, God. Him and Cody together was hilarious. Oh, they're just amazing people, you know. Uh, and it's just, you know, you could set Chinner was in Herdsey. Oh, my God. Every time I'd leave practice, I'd, have, I'd be like I just did 50 sit-ups because I've been laughing so hard. Hmm. You know, Lambo. I'll never forget Lambo skating by this huge brawl. And he'd say, and he'd start, nobody wants a piece of this, do they now? It could be all over in three seconds. And he was the smallest <laughs> guy on the ice by like a mile. And that was what broke it up because everybody started laughing. You know what I mean? It was just stupid stuff like that, you know. I, I lost it. Uh, there was a scrimmage. I was in Pensacola uh, when Gary was coaching. Mm-hmm. And they had this little short film. So he is your father. No. <laughs> <laughs> I did work for how's that the, team. How's the Japan or the China trip coming? Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I'm talking about your trip. Uh, I have. I fly. Are you going there? Are you going there for Thanksgiving? <laughs> no. Uh, but anyways, we had this little short guy, and uh, and then another guy on the team named Jeremy Gates, who's now the assistant coach in Rapid City. Little guy? No. Yeah. No, he's huge. <laughs> yeah, Gator's great. I love that guy. Love I play, it. I play Gator's him, mom is something else too. Yeah. But uh, there was a fight in, scrimmage, in a scrimmage against Huntsville, and this little guy skates out, and he's like, no, you can hear him in the bench. Nobody wants any of this. He's not the tallest man in the, in the room laying down. <laughs> and literally, everybody just sat down. <laughs> like, I'll never forget it, because people were, players were doubled over after swinging at each other, laughing so hard. I remember, Hersey was always the best at that. It was like... Uh... Some guy was had a stutter and he was trying to get on hers and he goes, Hey, pop the clutch, we got a game to play here. <laughs> wow. It's just a, a million things like that, you know. What I mean, it's just uh, like oh god love Hertzy. Man, he was so much fun. He still is. I know, I know. I think it's so cool that those guys went from one locker room to another. They did. Yeah. I'm just, trying to get Herzy and Warner both want to come on with us. Oh yeah. I, I, you, you guys should go, you guys should do one. Where you tape it from the Hillbilly Hockey League. Oh, that'd be cool. I mean, there's a bunch of guys out there you could do. And it's so much fun. It's colder than Billy Heck. Yeah, yeah. But it's so much fun out there. That would be cool. Of course, they don't start. They tell you they're going to start playing at 10. They don't start playing until 1230. You know what I mean? Huh. They get lubed up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. They must schedule like Nick. <laughs> yeah. But I, you really, but nobody wants to play goalie either. So Brandon used to play goalie. He's not bad. No, he's not. Uh, he's, he's still athletic, you know. But the most fun is talking to the wives there because they'll tell you the real stuff that's going on. Yeah, uh, <laughs> get Carrie and 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 Nicole out there and everything, and it's just it's fun. I mean, it's just a blast to go out there. It's like, <laughs> like it's in the middle of the swamp. You keep expecting Solomon Grundy to come up out of the muck, you know. What I mean? <laughs> but it's just it's really cool, and it's really neat that they still do that, you know. Yeah. But there's a lot of those were the fun stories, the stuff away from the rink. Mm-hmm. Those were the blasts. Well, some of the best ones we hear is like bus trips. Yeah. Well, having on a bus or the planes. Yes. Who's yes. the most the shittiest card player and who you don't want to play against. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or guys who've been playing together since they were eight. Yeah. You know, and that's dangerous too, you know. And well, and that's Sid and AJ now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was Sid and Bobby for a long time too, you know what I mean? But well, I mean, Bobby pulled the wool over some eyes this year, didn't he? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out of retirement sign a booster. Uh, I'm going to go to China. Well, yeah, you probably got twice the money, no taxes, and all that. He sends me pictures of, like, they were just in Moscow. He sent me a picture in front of the Kremlin, and I was like, man, that's cool as hell. Yeah. He yeah. goes, yeah. I knew he was going to come back, because I talked to him last year, and I was like, so you miss it? And he goes, I miss the boys. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is Bobby's, like, the toughest man alive. He's like Batman hockey. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's he's so tough. But he's one of the nicest guys ever, too. I mean, he's just a nice guy. Genuinely nice person. He's another one to talk a year off, though. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Once you get him going. Yeah. Now, there are stuff he won't talk about. Oh, yeah. Like, I would be, there would be stories I'd say, I, I've heard, you've been talking to Sid's mom again, haven't you? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and it was a really cool story, though, but I really want to tell it, and I want to tell it this way. And he'd say, uh, all right, I'll trust you. And then he'd let me tell the story, you know what I mean? But, I mean, I would always be respectful. If, if these guys, if I ever approached them with a story they didn't want to talk about, okay, you don't have to. Yep. You know, but, I mean, like, one of the cooler ones we ever did was, what do your tattoos mean? Yeah. And and, and Cody would talk about the lion and then his, his cousin and yep. all that stuff. I mean, Chad Ryan and I 
got to do some great stories on the tattoos because ta Chad was, he did some wonderful photos. Um, uh, one of my favorite stories of all time was when I convinced Steve Linsenmeyer to stay later in the game because photographers, they don't just have comments games to do. They have other things too. Yeah. So they always have to go do other assignments. Well, I, I convinced him. To, I said, Steve, you've got to trust me. There was just an incident I saw. There's going to be a huge fight in the third period. He goes, yeah, but I got to. I says, trust me. Will you trust me? Tell, blame it on me if it gets busted. And if you get in trouble about it, this is going to be the biggest story we've told in a while because I knew who was going to be involved and I saw it happen and I just knew it was going to happen. And I said, please, I will pay you. I'll bet you 50 bucks this happens. <laughs> so first minute of the third period, Jim Logan fights Mark Major. Oh, Logan. Old Jim is and, one of my favorites, man. Yeah. And it was a great fight and it wasn't a dirty fight or anything. And Steve's getting like 85,000 pictures of this one fight. He's got a uh, major getting tagged by a right and then vice versa. And it, it, that's it. That's the end of the fight. They go to the penalty boxes. Well, the linesman breaking them up was Wade Stuckey. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other coach, I don't remember who it was, ah, but I called Robert Rowe, who was the, the Flint radio broadcaster. And I says, this is what I want to do. I want to do a story about insight into a hockey fight. I want to know how it started, when it started, how it happened, what happened during the fight, what the linesman does to break it up, and what happens in on the bench. And I talked to Logie about it. He's like, this is so cool. And he got beat in the fight, although it was really a draw. But he says, yeah, I got beat. I started it. I made a cheap shot on this guy and this guy. And they all threatened me. And I'm like, bring it on, you know, and they're like, wait till Major gets back from the locker room, you know. And it happened exactly that way. And I talked to both coaches about what it was, you know, you know, this is going to happen. What's your thoughts on it and everything. And uh, I talked to Wade about it because he goes, yeah, I knew it was coming and everything. And then Mark Major called me back and talked to me about it for an hour. And he's like, I tell you what, that was a hell of a fight. And he tagged me good. I, everybody thinks I won because I landed on top of him. That is such bullshit. It was a draw. He tagged me the best I've got hit all year. And they were so open and honest about it. It was such a cool freaking story. And it was like three pages in the paper with all these pictures and everything. And, and you got Wade trying to break them up and his eyes are huge. And, and it was just so much fun. But it was fun to work with the photographers like that and like Ellie on the Pascal Morency story and, and Chad on the, the, uh, uh, the story. And the, the, the John, uh, remember the game, uh, the Atlanta game where I was talking about in the playoffs, Keith Hitchens was with me and he has this picture of uh, uh, John Mark Richard and Gruel and Chinner sitting against the boards after the goal and somebody skating up and their eyes are just so huge. It's like, oh, it was so much fun back then to be able to work with people who knew what they were doing, who trusted you. And if you said what was going to happen, happened and stuff. I mean, it was just so cool to be able to do that. All right, man. Well, did we make it? We you. made it through all the books, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we did okay. Yeah, they're all at Amazon.com on my Amazon page. Um, and you know, if you buy them for a gift for somebody for Christmas or whatever, reach out to me on Facebook or Twitter. I'll come sign them for you so you can give them as gifts and stuff. Um, that would I don't have any problem doing that. And we can personalize them for the person. Awesome. Um, we can do that. Um, and uh, don't forget the audio book for Bob, uh, the book on tape. <laughs> <laughs> and uh it's on bobchasebook.com um and uh enjoy it and i think i got one more comments book in me but we'll see um depends uh i don't know we'll see <laughs> awesome we'll let you get going because i know you have afternoon plans yeah i gotta go to church and help out there so we appreciate it and we're gonna have to do this again but next time now now i know where i'm coming <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna change the location next time. Yeah, we're gonna trick you. Well, well we normal we normally go to Ice House. That's uh -huh. where we do a lot of it. It's a little chilly there. A little bit. We're in the office. <laughs> we're right right around by Shock Shock's office. Yeah, yeah we he, pop, he pops in all the time while we're, we're right over, like Shocky, this happened. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it did. <laughs> he likes to stand just outside of the doorway so he can make his gestures yeah, about he can being pop on in camera. like a puppet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, he, he popped in too far when we had Sid on. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. We, couldn't, we couldn't see the whole thing, but then yeah. Sid goes, shh, shh, 
should we explain the gesture? Because he probably screwed up his junior career right now. It's, an, uh, yeah, it's physically impossible, but he did it anyway. <laughs> Right, well, thank fun. you guys. This was fun. Yeah, awesome. definitely. It's terrible you guys are so shy. I've learned. Right. I've, learned I've, I've actually learned a lot more about you than I knew. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I mean, I have a lot more respect for you. You didn't like me at all before this, did you? <laughs> as, as, a, as a person and a human. Oh, thank I mean, you very much. Before, you were just the comic guy, the comic guy, the comic guy. I never knew that you covered half the other shit you ever did. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, the I funny know. thing is, is I'm in. Five Hall of Fames. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, and I, those are wonderful. I mean, yeah. I never expect them. I never campaign for them. It's just like, oh, wow, that's a nice surprise. You know, I mean, um, I'm in like gymnastics and tennis and volleyball. You look like a gymnast. Yeah, sure, sure. You should see my front dismount. It's amazing. That's <laughs> it shocks the judges every time. <laughs> Get that damn leotard not to split. That's you know? awesome. I even got it. That's what she said with him here. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love covering those sports. I mean, I really did because nobody else paid him any attention, and I just love them. I mean, well, I, I think that goes back to what I've learned about you as far as your character and as far as your your uh, your passion well, last, for whatever last, you're doing. Last year was brutal. I mean, last year was it's just awful because yeah. – my schedule every year, my, my year goes by certain things. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. there's the tennis sectionals. There's the, the, the Comet season. There's the Bob Chase game. There's the Becky Carter Classic. There's basketball sectionals in February for the girls. I mean, it's like there's the volleyball. You know, I mean, there, it just, my whole year was mapped out yeah. for, for 30 years. You know, I mean, and suddenly that's gone. And it's like, oh, crap. You know, what do people do on weekends? You know, because I never had weekends, ever. It was always Friday, Saturday, Sunday working. People would be like, hey, let's go out for dinner before the game. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm there two hours beforehand. Well, let's hit the bar afterward. Uh, that's three hours after the game. You know, I mean, they just, yeah. it didn't compute to people, you know. Um, and now I've got that time, and it's like, what do you do on weekends, you know, if you're not going to the game and stuff? And, and it's, it's been interesting. Um, it's... Uh, I miss it. I really do, but I don't. There's nothing I can do about it. So yeah, um, I just sit back and read Justin like everybody else, and and just I'm thankful that he's doing it still. Well, you're always welcome here. Oh, thank you guys. I mean, not even as a comic guy, as a sports guy in general. You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you. So next time I have to have Kent and Larry come on with you. Oh my God! Oh That'll gosh! Fun one. We need more. We're gonna need some turn their mics down a little bit so I can actually talk. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me get, let me give you my best. We'll end up on this, okay? Let me give you my best Bob Chase Kent Harmon story. There we go. Okay. Um, Ninety-three. No, I'm I'm sorry. This was ninety-two. Ninety-three. We're in Atlanta for the All Star Game, and I actually predicted they were going to win at the All Star Game, the win at win the Cup at the All Star Game, because Pokey came in and stopped fifteen out of sixteen. Yeah. And I said, he's they're going to win if he plays like this. Yep. And that was I had no idea, you know, but I mean. I just knew they were going to, I didn't think they'd sweep by any stretch, but I could tell they were going to win if he was that zoned in. Uh, 92 is even better. So it's like bitterly cold in Fort Wayne. The Phoenix is hosting the all-star game and it's on Sunday. Well, it's a dry County, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, um, so Kent and I have a room and Bob gets kicked out of his room for some reason. He comes and stays with us. Huge mistake on our part. Um, so we got the door open. It's 92 there. You know, it's beautiful. And it's compared to what we came from. It's just spectacular. And it's a Sunday night and we're sitting there grousing because we don't have any beer. And this real little guy walks by the door and he hears Bob talking and he comes in. It's the San Diego chicken, Ted Giannolis, and who had met Bob. He was nobody. This is one of my all time greatest comet stats. The comets are 12 and 0 when the San Diego chicken is at a comet's game. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And don't ask me where I found that either, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I do need to get a life. Um, so uh, so he comes in and starts shooting the bull with us, and we're grousing because we got no beer. And he goes, oh, I was wait, I'll come. He comes back with two cases of cold beer. And so he sits there and has a couple beers with us, and then he leaves. 
And so we're like, well, we're like four or five beers in each. And it's like, well, we got to finish them. We could be ashamed to let them go to waste. <laughs> so the three of us try to finish off two cases of beer. And I can't drink near as much as Kent and Bob. And Bob. Nobody could drink as much as Bob. Uh, maybe Pembroke. Um, and so we, I don't remember if we, I don't think we finished. And that would have been alcohol poisoning probably. Hmm. But we, we do a really, we do ourselves proud. Okay. And it's two in the morning. We go to bed. Five o'clock. Bob's opening the curtains outside, and then he's doing his voice exercises. Me, 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 me. And Kent, I'm like, Kent, you get out and kill him. <laughs> he's getting ready to go on the radio show back home, which is like, it's it's like seven or eight in the morning here, and it's like five in the morning there. We just went to bed, you asshole. Come on, you know. And so it was like, seriously, Kent, go kill him. <laughs> and so Bob is Bob. And it's like, you've had three hours of sleep. He goes, yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's go. And he gets up and calls the best all-star game ever. And Kent and I are just sitting there. We're like dying the whole day. <laughs> and Bob's like fresh as a daisy calling the game. And it's like, we hate you. <laughs> <laughs> but that was like Bob. He could do it. And the other one was when we're in Detroit at the Palace. And the if you, if you remember, the Vipers had the worst uniforms in the history yes. of hockey. Yeah. They didn't have any pinstriping. So you couldn't tell the numbers. They were this mauve and uh, teal. And so you couldn't tell the numbers. And the, the, the press box was like eight stories high. Yeah. And I'm sitting next to Bob trying to help him spot. And he's calling everybody just on their mannerisms. He's got the lines. He got the lines from the PR guy. And he's calling the perfect game. Like The rest of us can't tell who scored, where the puck is, anything. And he's nailing it. And it's like, you really suck. You know, how do you do this? And he goes, I practice. You know, I mean, <laughs> it was like 2,500 games, maybe. I don't know. You know, I mean, wow. and he just nailed it. And he was nailing the Detroit players, too. Wow. It was just incredible. He was something special. He, he, he was. He was. I miss that guy. I still reach for the phone at least twice a week. I wonder if Bob saw this, you know. Yep. Yeah, I still. <laughs> that's hard. All right. Well, we'll end on, on that, that donor. No, that yeah. downer. Yeah. 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 So All right. uh, next Saturday, 2.30, we will have Pascal Morrissey on. Make sure you tune in. That'll be a uh, an episode that's not like normal. Nope. No. Pascal's not like normal. <laughs> no. Good guy. He's amazing. So, and the things he's doing, you do not want to miss this. I mean, he is just an amazing person. And the things he's doing to help others, it's like I couldn't be more proud of him. All right, guys. We'll see you next Saturday. Thanks for watching. Be safe on the trip to Cincinnati. I know a ton of you are watching.